Hi, everybody. I'm Wendy Murdoch, and this is Webinars with Wendy. We will be continuing to do webinars now, even though the weather's improving and hopefully the pandemic is getting under control. I know that in different places, it's kind of a spotty rollout. And a shout out to everybody in Australia that's dealing with the flooding. I was looking at some of the pictures, and it's uh, my heart goes out to you. I, I lived in Australia for a year, and I know the place can be very extreme, but it seems this past year you have had your share um, between droughts and then floods and fires. Um, so today my guest is Daisy Bicking. She's back with us. I'm so excited because Daisy and I had a great chat the other day. Um, and I have, I'm going to pop up my first poll. Let's see, launch poll. I wonder if, why I can't do like, okay, I've popped up a poll. So just put your answers in there. We'll give you about 30 seconds to just let us know. And um, that'll give some people time to come in if they want. Um, and I don't know why I can't roll out one question at a time. That's the thing that confuses me. Um, oh, well, the good news is that the majority of people are not dealing with acutely laminated courses. We're really happy about that. We want to keep it that way, actually. All right, we'll give you a few more seconds to answer the poll, and then I will go back and figure out how I can do one question at a time. Um, because apparently it's supposed to, do you have access? Yes, you should be able to see the poll. It, it came up on my screen. Did it come up on yours, Daisy? Yes, but I can't answer it. I can, I can see the results though, which is very interesting. Yeah. So just look on your screen there. We'll give it two more seconds. Um, well, okay. wait a minute. Your question says, is this horse chronic or acutely laminitic? laminitic? And it's yes or no. Wouldn't it be chronic or acute? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah. My, it was my fast typing. Okay. Okay. No, it's okay. I just, I'm re reading it and I'm thinking, how do I interpret yes or no in this context? Um, that either the horse is acute or chronic. Oh, I see what you're saying. I didn't quite get it right. You're right. Okay. That's how we learn to do these things. That's, yeah. I mean, this is like the second time. So if you don't do them, you never learn how to do them. It's just like Zoom. It's like, what's in my box that I put up on Facebook and said, what's in my box? I've had some interesting answers. Somebody thought it was an ironing board. <laughs> I was like, me ironing. Are you serious? Yeah. Um, so uh, no, it's not, but I, I will not give away the secret until I post later what is in the box. I'm waiting for more people to guess. Okay. Wow. All right, Daisy, why don't you give everybody a brief intro in case they don't know who you are, which is, would be kind of surprising, but it's possible. There's people um, who don't know me, really. Um, do you, are, I can close the poll? Can yeah. Show the results? Yep. You're going to show the results? Okay. Um, so hey, everybody. I'm really excited to be here on webinars with Wendy. Again, we have so much fun. And um, I'm, you know, a farrier out of um, southeastern Pennsylvania in the USA. And I um, have been a farrier for 17 years. I focus my work on rehabilitation, most commonly uh, laminitis and um, any kind of navicular arthritis issues, um, just itis in general. Um, so um, I'm excited to be here to talk to everybody about spring, preventing spring laminitis, because it is that season. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I can tell you that unfortunately my phone is ringing off the hook already, and we've had four new horses come here to the rehab center um, just in the past week who are really suffering and we're helping get them under control. Um, and then um, I've been traveling all over the Northeast also helping horses on emergency calls. So this and, is, and it this, doesn't even look like we have much grass yet. If I look in my paddocks, they're not green. No, right. Right. And it's like, it's so it's insidious. I don't know if it's the hormone change or if it's the season change or if it's that the grass is just, you know, more coming in more than we think. I don't know what the, I don't know what that's about, but it literally feels like, you know, here in Northeast US, when do you know we're in a similar region? Yep. We've had a huge weather change in the last week to 10 days. Yep. And it just seems like, it's gone from dreary winter to massive spring almost overnight. Yeah. And you know, the temperatures are in the, have been in like the sixties and seventies during the day. Today we were 24 degrees this morning. So we're getting those big swings, but it's during the day that's warm enough to grow grass. Right. So even if, even if you don't look on your lawn and go, oh, it's nice and green, there's stuff underneath there that's coming up. That's right. That's right. So, um, 
So at any rate, so um, I have a presentation for us if you want to start that because I like to have pictures and slides and you know I understand some people are visual learners so yep. like to have both those things so we can start that and just talk as we go. Does that sound good? Perfect. Wonderful. Okay, share my screen. Okay. Doo -doo -doo. I should be able to use my mouse in this mode. Yep. Can you see that okay? Yeah. And okay. people love pictures and slides, okay? <laughs> Perfect. Yes, good. Okay, so um, it's it's spring. It's wonderful. We have grass coming in, the bugs are coming back. I've seen flies and mosquitoes already. But I saw a butterfly yesterday for the first time. That's fabulous. One of your butterflies that you've released? Um, no, just a white one. I My monarchs are somewhere down south right now. <laughs> Um, so, you know, most people, we, we have spring come and we're all excited. It's a relief from winter for us. Um, and those of us that have four true seasons. And so, you know, we're, we're just like in a really good mood, right? But I drive by these fields of grass and all I think is yeah. poison, poison. And it's terrible. I'm so biased because of the kind of work that I do that when I see a nice green field and I see lots of horses out on it, I have anxiety, which is terrible because when did it get like this? Like what's what's the deal with all of this, which is what we're here to talk about, right? Like why is the grass a problem now when it wasn't in the past, right? Because it does seem to coincide with the grass coming up. Now there's a lot of other factors we're gonna talk about tonight if you're really trying to be proactive and prevent your horse from getting um, laminitis. Um, this is a huge component for what we're talking about tonight for this time of year. Right. Um, so, you know, the question is, how do we go from this cute pony, this beautiful Welsh that's jumping and athletic to this miserable laminitic animal that can barely walk? And then how do we get them back to here where, you know, they're moving well, they're rehabilitated and they can go back to work. And then how do we prevent that from happening in the first place? Because I can tell you, when I see that green field of grass and I think, oh my gosh, my anxiety goes up and I see the horses there just munching away, it makes me worry that it's like an inevitable train wreck. And it's not. I mean, a lot of horses can eat grass, but in my line of work, I deal with the ones that have problems with it. So how do you know the difference, right? How do we prevent this, this poor pony from getting there? So just a little bit of background about laminitis so that we all know what we're talking about because not everybody really understands what laminitis is, right, Wendy? Yep. Okay, so the um, these are beautiful slides from Mike Savoldi. Um, did, you, did, did you move forward because it's still stuck on the Welsh? Oh, I hate it when it does that. Why does it do that sometime? Here? I don't know. Sometimes it doesn't move. Okay, let's see. Now there's two videos playing. Do you see that? Nope. We're still on the little Welsh pony jumping and then... Which I get really miserably and yeah, I know. And you don't want to look at that. No. That's, how's that? You're on the Welsh. Now, can you see the next one? Uh, it's still trying to bring your sh screen up. It's a black screen right now. It says Daisy started screen share. Okay. What, it what I've learned what it does that is I have to like close keynote and reopen that. Yep. And uh, while you're doing that, somebody's asked, can you include anything on getting keeping feet in best shape from PPID and EMS? Horses who have had previous laminitis have long-term thin soles, low heels, pedal bone rotation to deal with the future risk from metabolic issues. Yes, and there are also many other webinars that we've done. Um, Dr. Harmon did one on PPID. Um, uh, I, th I think we've had, you've done stuff like that too. So yeah. the whole playlist on the Surefoot Equine YouTube that is hoof, go start watching some of those other webinars um, because and then Dr. Harmon's. So um, I will also tell you that um, we could, Wendy, we could do a follow-up webinar on- Always. Like, I know, because we have fun with these things. <laughs> uh, on the um, the things that I look at in particular. Can you see that now? Uh, give it a sec. Okay. It says Daisy started sharing screen. It's still black. Why is it still black? I don't know. I hate it when that happens. I do. Yeah, we had this problem when you and I were doing this the other day and then it fixed itself. I know. Um, Does that work? Hang on. Usually it takes a second once you share. Okay, I'll wait. I'll wait. Um, no, it is not coming up. It's not my strong suit, being patient. I know, and it's not, I should have come up by now. I know. 
all. That's really annoying. Sorry, guys. Give us one second here. So yeah, somebody says it's just internet speed, but we, um, Daisy and I had this problem yesterday when we were zooming, and I typically don't. You know, when somebody shares their screen, it usually comes up. So I think it's. I hope you don't have to restart. I, I shouldn't. We didn't the other day. No, you just you just closed Keynote and reopened it. Yeah. All right, let's try it this way. Can you see it now? Yay, there it is. Okay. All right, so let me try. I'm just gonna leave it like this. I know it's a little bit raw this way, unless you want me to try to expand it again. Yeah, see, now that it's up, see if you hit expand if it if it actually works. Okay. Because sometimes it's just the the order of go. Okay, but that stopped it sharing, right? No, it's still it's still up there on Lamina. Oh, it is. Yes, but it hasn't gone big. There. There. That? No, it's big. We're good. Yay. I love that. And I have a mouse so I can point at things, which is the yep. point. Okay. So um, these are slides from Mike Savoldi. And um, I love his slides because he kind of leaves the hoof capsule intact for us. And we can really see where the horny structures are, meaning the insensitive structures, versus the vascular structures, which have the blood and nerves. And the lamini are those. Um, what look like pleats on a lampshade that run down here on the inside of the wall and they velcro to, so to speak, the, um, the sensitive lamina here that cover the bone. And on a close up look, they look like this. They look like fingers that interlock together, sensitive and insensitive, and that should be a tight bond. So when you have laminitis and you, you get a failure of that connection is the simplest way to explain it. And so the lamina, the picture of the lamina on microscope there that you have, uh -huh. the lamina go horizontally and hook together. In other words, they're this and this, even though they look no, this they're way. They're this way. So you're seeing a slice like this, and they yep. go up and down like a lampshade. Like think about the pleats on like a oh, lampshade. Okay. Yep. So you'll see the pleats right here. See them right here where they they like these long fingers. Oh, yeah. And then those fingers interlock with these fingers vertically. And what you're seeing here is a cross section. They're like this, but tall. Okay. Okay. So, and that, that attachment is super, super, super strong. So if you take um, a healthy foot in dissection um, and you grab the toe and, or grab the, the wall and try to peel it away, it is so hard to peel away that usually you have to do something like boil the foot or let it desiccate a little bit or something to be able to remove that wall. Wow. On a laminic foot, if you grab it, it just goes bloop. It's awful. Sorry. Yeah, it's awful. And then you think about the horse walking around on that, depending on how bad their laminitis is, and it's, it's like mind blowing they can come back from it at all. Is the ins what is the insensitive lamina made of versus the sensitive lamina? Well, this is keratin. Okay, like keratin. your fingernail. Yep, because they are standing on their digit, right? They're standing on their finger, so yep. that like a more more evolved weight bearing device for them. Because you know the they don't stand on like we stand on our feet, which has our talus, our hock on the ground, right? Right. So they are evolved. So the hock is off the ground and the fetlock is like your first knuckle of your toe. And they actually have three bones in their distal, distal phalange, just like we do. And then they stand on that tip of the bone, which, which is, which is bananas when you think about it that way. Yes, I agree. So yeah, so this connection has evolved to be very strong to hold up the horse and do locomotion and all those things, unless something disrupts it. So the insensitive lamina is more keratin layer, and then the sensitive lamina is obviously more blood filled. It's blood and nerves. Yep, okay. blood and nerves. Yep, and I have a slide that'll show a little bit more of that, but it's it's um it's soft tissue versus horn, right? Vascular, avascular, to try to keep it simple. Yep. Okay, so. Um, what is laminitis? I mean, laminitis, itis, right, is defined as inflammation of the lamini. Lamini or lamilli, depending on where you live, is plural for lamini. Lamina, right? A lamina. Yep. Lamini, lamelli, because Americans have to change everything. Um, it's different from founder, though, because founder is a lay term that was derived from, a, from nautical terms. Um, like to dive. So founder, if you're a submarine, it means that um, you're diving down in the ocean. 
the bone dives down, which is why they call it founder in lay terms. Um, you know, it's hard when we have a lay term versus a medical term because we get confused. What's what? And I'm going to talk about that in a little more detail in a moment. Um, and this is a disease process. So what we want to look at is um, we want to identify the nature of this illness of laminitis and examine the symptoms, okay, of how do we get to laminitis? What tells us that a horse has laminitis? Okay. So I really prefer to stick to the word laminitis than founder. Because when you say founder, a lot of people say founder and they mean like rotation or sinking or once you have displacement of the bone. But I don't think that that's specific enough because there's actually a lot more going on with laminitis than just the bones in place or the bone isn't in place. There's a lot more in between. So for example, um, listening to Dr. Scott Morrison years ago at the laminitis conference um, that New Bolton Center put on, he talked about referring to everything as laminitis in developmental, de developmental laminitis, which is before you see pain. So there's damage happening before you see the pain in a horse. That's why we can have a horse that's standing out there fine one day and the next day they're not and there's been damage going on and we didn't know it. So it's, it's insidious, it's awful. Then there's acute laminitis, which is when you have active inflammation and the horse is now painful. So when you see inflammation and you see pain, the laminitis has been going on well before that no matter what kind of laminitis you have, okay? Then he called founder, he called founder chronic laminitis. And I liked that because chronic then says, well, now you have laminar changes, you have rotation or sinking or displacement of the bone in the hoof capsule. And so um, once you have that, you've got permanent change to that connection of the lamini. They can go back, they can reattach, but they're never as strong as they were before. And a lot of times they've got scar tissue in there as well. So. Chronic laminitis is once you have displacement of P3. Chronic subacute laminitis would be you have a horse that's had changes, but they're still in the acute process. So they're still very painful and they're in an acute process. You can also have chronic stable, which means they've had changes, but they're stable. Their feet are functional, they're well managed. You can do things with them, they're sound, there's no active changes going on. Okay. So and would that be the kid, the horse that I showed you yesterday? Right. She's got changes to her feet because of past acute episodes, but even though she's got a chronically laminated foot forever to some degree, because you're always going to be managing that, she's stable. Yep. Okay. Um, and then I throw in there one more because I think, you know, this is something that's become more and more on our radar as we really understand laminitis is subclinical laminitis. And subclinical laminitis is when you have an underlying um, inflammation of those lamini without external signs of laminitis. And that's not to be confused with developmental because developmental is part of the acute onset that's very sudden and very acute and very rapid. Subclinical is like this insidious low grade simmer that happens and the horses don't show us. And we see that in feet. And I'm gonna talk about that because if you're trying to prevent laminitis, seeing signs of subclinical laminitis in your horse's feet or behavior would be really helpful. Right. So, so um, just out of curiosity with subclinical, would, how often would you see some type of gait change? Well, subclinical is without signs. So you wouldn't see any gait change whatsoever. They'd be jumping just the same way. They'd be, you know, That's going true. down the trail. You, fox. Might the, you might see the horse's footy. Oh, he has a stone bruise, right? Like you're not going to call it laminitis. It's not going to be digital pulses and hot feet and rocking back and resistance to walking. It's going to be, oh, he doesn't like gravel, right? Oh, yeah, he must have a stone bruise. Oh, you know, he's got these thin soles. He just has thin soles. Well, okay, but what if it's not just any of those things? What if it's actually you've got laminar change happening and you know, intervention would be a good idea before it turns into something bigger because we see this all the time. So it's the kind of stuff that we sort of write off as something else. Right. Not that not that all things that we write off as something else are laminitis, but that's often it should be considered. Okay. Right? Like it should be on the radar of, oh my horse is sore on gravel and has thin soles. Well, do you see any other signs that could actually mean that your horse is got inflamed lamini? For whatever reason, then you got to figure out why. So 
you know, you'd want to get radiographs proactively. You'd want to talk to the veterinarian. You'd want to ask your farrier, you know, if what they think about the situation and the health of your horse's feet over time. Have they been improving? Have they been declining? Why? You know, be, be proactive for your horse. That's the most important thing is as an owner that you're, that you're asking all these questions. Yeah, so already somebody wants to change their answer because they have a chronic stable laminated horse and they didn't understand the terminology. There you go. Awesome. So you, so you see why I like the word laminitis instead of founder. And when we talk about it in these four types, you know, with two subtypes for chronic, so five types, really it describes every type of laminar change that we might run into. Okay. Okay. I mean, certainly, you know, laminitis is really difficult. I mean, you know, this is just six radiographs of horses that I've worked on that all had diagnosed laminitis. And these were all considered chronic, acute or chronic um, stable because they all have displacement of P3 inside that hoof capsule. And we're gonna talk a little more about that, of course, but this is technically not a webinar about what do you do about laminitic feet, right? right. This about how to prevent spring laminitis. So keep in mind that there's things I know that everyone probably has questions about, but I'm kind of like keeping it light for this purpose because there's a lot to talk about about prevention and I don't wanna like not get to that stuff. Well, and the bottom line is if we prevent our horses from looking like this on radiograph, we are much better off. <laughs> That's right, exactly. Don't let it get to this point, exactly. Okay, so why does laminitis happen, okay? Um, there's basically amongst the, the scientific community right now, there are basically four types, give or take, there's some overlap. There's some discussion about what's what, um, but you basically have some kind of toxemia and, um, talking to Dr. Chris Pollitt, who's one of the world's leading researchers in laminitis. Um, he basically thinks everything is toxemia. So basically it goes back to the horse gets toxic for some reason, the gut that gets disturbed, um, and then all sorts of enzyme problems happen and the feet start falling apart, okay? So toxemia, as we think of it traditionally, would be like um, um, an acute illness, right? Like um, explosive diarrhea of some kind or um, a fever related something or a retained placenta um, or like a grain overload is going to affect the gut flora, okay? So that's, toxemia kind of fits all those acute things into that category. Um, Endocrinopathic laminitis is like what we think about with our um, spring grass often is the insulin resistant, the equine metabolic syndrome, the Cushing syndrome horses. Um, that's its own category. When I first started going to the, the laminitis conference um, put on by Penn down in West Palm Beach, this would have been 2005 was my first one. They don't do them now, but I went to every one. Um, they, um, they weren't talking about endocrinopathic laminitis at all. It was all um, retained placentas, grain overload, compensatory limb, and mechanical founder. That's all it was. And of course, you know, I was in the field and I was seeing all these metabolic types. But back then, you know, I joined Dr. Kellen's um, Cushing's group back when it was 600 people. You know, mm -hmm. and now it's like what 10,000, right? So. Um, so this is, you know, I've watched the evolution of these definitions and it's been very interesting to see how it, it's now we have kind of two different tracks of laminitis. You've got the metabolic horses, the endocrinopathic horses, and then you've got the acute horses that have something massive happen to them, like, um, like, like acute illness, grain overload, compensatory limb, um, or some kind of mechanical road founder concussive type of laminitis. Um, Think about if a horse has compensatory limb, like they've tried to make horses founder, get acute laminitis, from tying up one leg, compensatory limb, right? Standing too hard on one leg and, and then that foot founders. They can't make them do it. Why doesn't every horse who has a horrible abscess also get compensatory limb laminitis if they hold their foot up in the air for 10 days or two weeks because it hurts too much, they don't walk on it much? Because there has to be another component, which is where the toxemia comes in. There has to be something else underlying that makes certain horses get compensatory limb laminitis. Do the they see way. a breed tendency in laminitis? Well, no, not really. I mean, there's so many different kinds of it. All these different things can cause laminitis. So I think we could say that certain breeds, we see more breeds than others have more endocrinopathic laminitis. 
but I don't think that there's any studies that show definitively that like Morgans or Arabians or Halflingers or certain types of ponies are more are more prone to it. It tends to be more about their individual pers uh, uh, not personality. That's not what I'm going for. Um, Body mechanisms. But yeah, like like their constitution, right. right? As opposed to breed. You know, I have an Arabian here who um, is 29. No, he turned 30 this year, and no stitch of any metabolic disease. I, I'm blown away. Yeah. I mean, every other Arabian I've owned, which is a number of them, have all had metabolic disease. So you'd think, oh, it's Arabs. Maybe. You know, maybe. It would be an know. interesting study for them to 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 look at that just to put some data behind it. I would be curious, but I, you know. I'm sure somebody's working on it. The problem that I think you run into is what what breeder wants to support yeah, that's true. on the genetics of metabolically genetic laminitis, right? Like, for example, I worked in a barn that had um, two that bred two different lines of Arabians. One was an Egyptian line and one was a Polish line. And all the Polish horses had laminitis, all of them. They had like generations of them because they kept them and retired them and whatever. And then the, um, the Egyptian ones all had um, club feet. No laminitis, no matter the age, they all ate the same thing. They all lived in the same environment. They were all managed the same way. So I'm sure there's some kind of genetic component. I just don't have a good answer as exactly what that is. Right. So um, where do you put winter founder? You mean like cold induced laminitis? Yeah. Well, you know, that's interesting because it's kind of like a new thing. And I don't know that those horses, I mean, look, this is my, this is my opinion. I'm not a veterinarian, but I don't know that in my mind, those horses truly get winter laminitis. I feel like they're um, endocrinopathic horses that get neuropathy in their feet and they interpret cold as pain. Oh. So to me, winter laminitis is like, yeah, they have laminitis symptoms, but it's like our type two diabetics where they have you know, neuropathy in their feet and the nerves get really turned on, right? Pain wind up turned on. So when they get cold, you know, they, their, their nerves don't understand, oh, I'm cold. They mistake it for painful. And then they get like painful feet, like laminitis. That's really fascinating because, you know, um, you think about how horses can tolerate so many different kinds of environmental temperatures. Right. Um, and then feet. Yeah, right? doing hot pavement versus, um, you know, they don't get frostbite, right? Like right. in their legs. So yeah, why would, why would cold induce laminitis? And I really think that it's part of the endocrinopathic problem and that they get um, neuropathic pain and that makes them sensitive to cold. Interesting. That's a really interesting hypothesis. I, I... That's my idea. I mean, because it helps them if we warm their legs up and warm their feet up, right? Like we put leg warmers on them we put wool in their boots, we blanket them, we try to keep their core temperature warm, we try to keep their, their legs warm, and it, and it really helps. And they respond, those horses tend to respond, in my experience, they tend to respond to gabapentin as a pain relief from the veterinarian because it's for nerve pain. Uh -huh. So it kind of like, kind of fits for me, but I'm sure other people have other ideas about that. And I think- no, it's a, a fascinating yeah. idea because I was like, you know, there's no, there's no trigger other than it's, you know, winter time. Right. And you think that like, you know, there's no grass, you know, like, you know, there's snow on the ground, there's no grass, you know, the horses are just standing around eating. Maybe they're not moving much. Maybe there's not as blood, much, much blood flowing, like, like feet slow down in the winter than versus the, the warmer months. Yeah. And I'm sure that's because the blood's not circulating as much in their feet. Maybe that's part of it, you know, um, but you're certainly not going to go force walk those horses. They're miserable. Right. Right. Yeah, oh, it's bad. Okay. I agree. Yeah. Okay. So like I mentioned, we kind of pick these two, the, all these reasons of laminitis out into the two types. So the toxemia cases that are like acute illness, grain overload, the compensatory limb laminitis, those horses go from zero to 60 and they're very scary. And those are hospital cases. Those are not the kind of cases that we're talking about being worried about in the spring because that can happen at any time and they just tank on you. And then you need them to be in hospital care 
where they can have emergency intervention as to what's going on. Because once they start rotating or sinking, they can crash really badly. And ask me how I know that. Because I've tried to help them here on my farm and it's really hard. And it's this can happen really fast. Yes, very fast. Like it can happen from one day to the next. Yep. So, you know, sometimes our metabolic horses can do that, but it's much more rare. Those horses tend to do a slow slide. And that's where we get into that subclinical laminitis. Like they've had things going on for a long time and then something tips them over the edge into more, you know, chronic subacute laminitis. Because when you radiograph those horses' feet, nine times out of 10, they've already had evidence of previous laminitis. We just didn't know that they did. So it's been going on. It's like a slow slide instead of this acute crash. So these horses are your endocrinopathic horses. They can be concussion horses, the mechanical road founder horses. I mean, don't get me wrong. Like I've worked on a horse that was really cool. You know, it was sad what happened to him, but he did really well, who um, was um, on a, slated for um, the Olympics. He was an inventor. He was slated for the Olympics when it was in Atlanta, I think, when it was so hot that year. Oh yeah. And they were like schooling the horses um, you know, like at 4 a.m. because it was too hot. And this horse was super hot thoroughbred. And he got loose from his groom after doing some um, schooling on the course. He got loose and he was such a diddle that he ran around for like 45 minutes and nobody could catch him. And he gave himself heat stroke. Ugh. And, he, and he foundered and he actually slept his hoof capsules. Ugh. And he was brought back by somebody else. And then I got to take care of him for a long time. And he did really well, which was amazing. Um, but that's like road founder, but acute, like that's like an acute onset of an illness that created this acute episode of laminitis in his feet. I'm talking about, you know, the Amish horses that, that drive down the road and have a lot of concussion or a lot of our, um, hunter jumper horses that, you know, they get into their teens and you, you, they start having soundness problems and you look at their feet, they're not metabolic at all but they've got huge evidence of pedal osseitis, laminitis, changes to the bone, showing that they've had subclinical laminitis or like a mechanical concussive related strain on that lamini over time. So, so that makes me wonder about, you know, like police horses that are on hard roads. In other words, there are horses that can handle that that don't wind up with laminitis. I don't know about that. Okay. I I really think they all do to some degree. It's just whether it becomes a soundness issue. Like think about us, Wendy, like, you know, we, we shrink over time, right? Due to gravity, we get wear and tear issues with our joints just by doing the things we love to do repetitively. Right. And that doesn't mean that it's a, it's not, it doesn't mean that, that we're not capable of still doing those things. It's just over time, we're going to have some challenges when it comes to staying sound or comfortable doing those activities like running, right? Like, you know, I love to run and I've had to like moderate a little bit what I was doing because I was doing so many miles that I started getting like my hamstring started hurting chronically. I think also because of being a barrier, right? Bending over. The combination, yeah. <laughs> right. But I had to be mindful of that and say, well, if I don't want this to continue, then I'd better change a little bit of my routine and what I'm doing or I will have wear and tear issues. So a lot of the police horses are going to boots or composite shoes for that reason. Ah. So, you know, which is really awesome to see because they're typically big, heavy horses. Right. And, you know, there's a lot of force coming down on those feet and they get mechanical problems. But if you radiograph them, like every single draft horse has some version of pedal osseitis because they're so big and heavy. They just do. Just the name for the beast. Right. Right. Yeah. They get, they get modeling to their bone because of concussion. And right. then a lot of them founder. So, you know, like they, the, the chronic side to me over there is like closely connected where the acute side is closely connected, but they're different animals. They're just, they just, they need to be managed differently. And that's not what we're talking about. The acute side is not really what we're talking about with spring laminitis, even though the spring laminitis might look very acute at the time, it's a different, it's a different animal. Really interesting. Okay. Okay. All right. So, um, you know, endocrinopathic laminitis is most impacted by change of season. That's what we're just talking about. Right. And we have some really good resources out there where you can go and study these things. So if you haven't tapped into these things, you know, the equine Cushing's and insulin resistant group is great. And the laminitis site is out of the UK that they're fantastic. They all talk about a lot of the same things. 
we don't know nearly enough about laminitis. Like it seems like this should be really straightforward, but we have like tons of different things that we're trying to figure out with it. It's like curing cancer. You know, it's, it's like, you think we'd have an answer by now, but we really don't, <coughs> excuse me. So, you know, the, the bottom line of all this, and this is like, if you take one thing out of what I talk about here today, get yourself educated, talk to as many people as you can read as many things as you can peruse these sites, connect with people that deal with it. So you can start educating yourself and recognize things before they happen and have a plan of what to do. It's like, you don't know what to do with a horse that gets colic unless until you have a horse with colic, mm -hmm. right? So the goal of this is to say, if you knew you needed to have some banamine on hand and you knew to give your horse, um, you know, like um, some intervention when, when there's a huge temperature change so that they don't, you know, get a belly ache. Well, you would do those things proactively just to prevent the possibility. But if nobody told you those things and then your horse gets a belly ache, and then they're like, oh, well, it's to prevent this in the future. And you're like, why didn't somebody tell me that beforehand? Right. right? That's what I'm talking about. Okay. So the most, the most important thing is that whoever is on your horse's care team, the veterinarian, the owner, bar manager, trainer, whoever takes care of your horse, of course, the hoof care provider, any complimentary practitioners you work with, right? Your body worker, your dentist, your chiropractor, your integrative care provider, everybody needs to be on the same page. Like Wendy, who in the world is supposed to be in charge of diet? Well, you know, that's a really fascinating question because typically if you're, you know, have your horse in a barn, the diet is controlled by the barn manager. Right. Are they an expert on laminitis? Yeah. Um, are they an expert on, um, I don't know, allergies in horses? Not necessarily. Some know more than others, right? I'm not trying to disparage the right. barn that they're being in charge of the diet because a lot of them study a lot and they're really dedicated to feeding horses well. But we, you know, to, to that point, there was a time when we trusted the feed companies to tell us what was the best thing to feed our horses. And yeah. what we've come to learn is on a chemical basis, maybe they know what the best thing is to feed the horses, but on a metabolic basis, that may not be the case for our particular horse. Well, right. And everybody has a perspective, right? Like, just like there isn't enough information about laminitis, there's not nearly enough information about nutrition with horses specifically. Yeah. So what suits one breed or one level of work versus another breed or another level of work or various climates or accessible forage. You know, the grass here in Pennsylvania is not the same as grass that's gonna be in Colorado. They're just that's different. And the hay, the hay is gonna to be totally different. It's gonna be different. Um, you know, even like brands of feed that are available, you know, what, what we feed here in the Northeast may not be available out West. They might have something different that they're feeding. I can guarantee you it's not. <laughs> right. right. My experience as well. So, you know, I think that this is just an example of if you have, as the owner of the horse, if you have opinions about what the horse is eating, and then the veterinarian has opinions, and then the farrier has opinions, and then your holistic practitioner has opinions, Whose opinion do you follow? And how do you know that you're making the best choice for your horse? And can you actually implement the change? Right, is it practical? Is right. it affordable? Is it practical? You know, if you're living in a boarding situation, they may not be able to mix 16 different supplements for you into the feed every day. Right. So absolutely. I mean, I think we overcomplicate these things in general. And I think because we don't know nearly enough about it that some variety is important. You know, like they say, if you feed your dog or your cat the same brand of food day in, day out, every day, their entire life, they're probably going to be missing something at some point. So some variety is, is beneficial. We, we can't even decide whether grains are beneficial for dogs or not. Ugh. Remember that whole thing about beneficial grains, like not corn, maybe not wheat, but barley, maybe some other things might be beneficial for heart health. And yet there are still people that are like, nope grain-free and then raw versus kibble or wet food. I mean, it, it's mind-blowing. So yeah. well, we I, can't figure out how to feed ourselves either. So well, that's true. You're right. That's true. So <laughs> I think to me, what's most important with this, we're going to talk about some different ideas, just in my experience, what's beneficial. It's my opinion. <clears throat> okay. Do your research, be educated and make sure that no matter what, everybody on your team is on the same page, which means you need a team leader. And as the owner, 
you're the person that's supposed to make the executive decision for your horse. So if you're not educated, who are you going to trust? You know, I come in and I'm like, oh my gosh, don't feed that. Well, because I see green grass as poison. I mean, that's really bizarre for certain horses, like certain horses. Well, you you yeah. see all those horses that suffer from it, but there are horses that can eat green grass. And the other thing is that not all green grass is the same. I actually have a metabolic pony who has had laminitis in the past, who, if she doesn't get grass, gets massive water in her manure. Oh, interesting. She's 31. We've tried every single repair to her gut we can the best thing for her is just getting a little bit of grass in the morning every day and it just keeps her solid yeah and it's like but yet she's metabolic so you know keep in mind for me there's really no good wrong right or bad it's about being educated and making the best decision for the time and place for your animal which of course is super simple right <laughs> i mean you know like could it be any more complicated anyway okay so just Make sure that the people you're working with, that you don't have practitioners fighting over um, like the horse should be in metal shoes, the horse should be barefoot, the horse should have the heels raised, the horse should have the heels lowered, the horse should eat only this amount of hay per day, the horse should have free choice hay. Like find people who agree that resonate with you and the research that you do. And, and another thing to that is we don't always have control of everything in our environment. And we need to look at the thing that is most critical for that particular horse and pick a thing that we're going to make a change, not change everything at once. Horses can't handle it when you turn everything upside down and neither can the support people around you like the barn manager and the grooms. So, you know, pick, pick the most critical thing and, and implement one change, see how that goes and then progress. Otherwise you'll make yourself insane. Believe me. <laughs> I have one thing to add about that though. Okay. If you have a horse that's in crisis and actively laminitic, you better change things fast. Yes. I, and that's a, I'm talking about preventative. Yes. Preventatively. Like in yes. preventative, you know, you suddenly realize, wow, my horse is on too much grass, you know, to go in and scream at your barn manager is not going to get the result you want. <laughs> no. um, absolutely. Not. Absolutely not. Yep. Okay, good. So laminitis is a disease of prevention, period period okay so i'm telling you if you watch this webinar and you go home and you look at your horse and you're like hmm gee should i be worried if you see these things that i'm going to enumerate here if it looks like a duck and it quacks like a duck it's a duck if it's metabolic if it's got the phenotype right so endocrinopathic laminitis or metabolic laminitis can be absolutely assessed based on the body condition of the horse is that what phenotype, what's the definition of phenotype? The, the body condition, the type, the build, the style, the, the obesity versus, you know, skinniness, um, phenotype, the physical presentation of the horse in front of you is I think what the technical definition. Okay. Okay. So, um, you know, the first thing you're going to look at for phenotype is the horse's weight. Okay. So, and a fat horse is not necessarily going to get laminitis. I think the statistic, if I remember correctly, is 50% of obese horses get laminitis. Okay. So just because your horse is fat doesn't mean it's going to founder. However, if I told you that you had a 50% chance of your horse getting catastrophic colic or bowing a tendon or ripping his hoof off, if you did X, 50%, would you do that? No, you wouldn't do that. Yet we look at our obese horses and we're like, Oh, they're so happy. Look, he's so big. He's a big boned horse, you know? So or he's well muscled. The people do muscle. confuse muscle with fat or fat. Yeah. With yes, absolutely. When Wendy foundered my, my horse, Wendy, that you met, that I rehabbed, that brought me to hoof care. He was in dressage work five days a week. We were doing clinics with you and he got laminitis and was massively obese. And I thought he was just muscled. I didn't know. I was an owner. I didn't know. That was a long time ago. We've known each other for a long time. We have, but you know, look at what you've done with that knowledge. Thank you. So yes, it was still a blessing. So um, when you assess phenotype, I like to use the Henneke body condition scale because it's very specific. So you can look at fat deposits um, along the neck, along the withers, at the ribs, behind the shoulder, in the loin, they'll get that like channel down their back, around their tail head, they get like a, an apple 
an apple tush, you know, where like the tail comes down and it looks like the top of a really nice um, red delicious apple right there. This horse is massively obese. Yeah. He's like a full nine. I mean, he has like rolls of fat down here, if you can see it. Okay. His crest is huge. He's got the um, fat pad here at the withers. He's got one here behind the shoulders. You can't see the top of him right now, but he does have a big channel down his back. He's got the fat pads on his butt. Um, he, you can also have orbital fat pads where the dimples above their eyes, right, get filled in with fat. Um, and the worst of these, just like if you saw a middle-aged man walking down the street who had a pot belly and had muscle wasting, what would you think about that person? He's pretty unfit and pretty fat. <laughs> yes, like, like ready for a heart attack, yes, right? Exactly. He has diabetes, ready for a heart attack, definitely leaving fat in bad places. Some of these horses will have ribs showing and still have all the fat deposits. And I've come across many veterinarians who seeing that say, oh, you have an older horse, it needs to gain weight and they give it tons of food, like, like inappropriate food, like weight gaining senior food. And really it's a metabolic horse that's in trouble. So these horses are not all just generally obese. They can have these fat pads, which is why this Henneke body condition scale is so helpful. And yet you can see ribs or you can feel ribs easily. And you're like, oh, they're not fat. It's just like the, the muscle wasting of the man that has type two diabetes and has probably had a heart attack and probably has a pacemaker. And yet he has a big pot belly because he's metabolically incompetent. And you know, it's, it's interesting because as a riding instructor, you know, I, I, I see horses that are overweight and it's, people get offended mm -hmm. that oh, yeah. when you tell them that their horse is fat and they, and it's a weird, it's weird because instead of thinking this is a danger sign, they're offended. Like you're picking on my horse. And I'm like, you know, exactly what I'm talking about. <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, it's one of the reasons why I get fired sometimes. Yeah. Because I come in and I, I know where that's going and seeing the train wreck that's about to happen gives me the courage to speak up and advocate for the horse. And I try to be kind, but I'm not nice. Does that make sense? Yeah. Well, it's it, what you're seeing is the dangers. And uh, you know, I, my case in point, I was teaching out in Washington state and they had three horses and they were irrigating their pasture and these horses were, and they were, had fat pads at least as big as this horse. And I said to them, this is a danger. And then their business burned down and they didn't pay attention to their horses and they lost one, saved one. And the other one was kind of serviceable because they, they were a danger zone into a disaster. This is a huge red flag. If your horse has these types of fat deposits, I'm gonna show you some pictures of some other horses. Um, you absolutely need to intervene to get the weight off of them. We have the ultimate control over everything that goes in the horse's mouth, right? They, they don't have a say. We control it all. Are you going right. to get grass? Are you going to get sweet feed? Are you going to get mineral balancer? Are you going to get what kind of hay? What are you going to eat? I wish we could control ourselves this way. I right? know. <laughs> right? right? We, were, we were driving earlier today, going to a barn, and we opened up a bag of um, cheddar popcorn, and I am embarrassed to admit that it was all gone by the time we got to our barn. Because popcorn, you know, it's like, oh, yeah, we're driving, we're bored, you know, we're like chatting. Oh, it was bad. Well, and the food companies know how to trigger our fat sugar. So. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, that's so tasty. Okay, so the Heineke body condition scale is really, really specific. So it goes on a scale of one to nine, and... Um, you know, body condition one, of course, would be very poor condition. And it's going to describe the neck, the withers, the shoulder, the ribs, the loin, and the tail head. Daisy, is there somewhere people can find this? Because it's a little bit small on the screen to read all the print. Yeah, it's really, we don't have to read all of it at the moment. If you search it online or you message me, email me, text me, whatever, I'll get you a copy of it. But it's searchable. Okay. Okay. If you just Google search it, it'll pop up. Um, it's really been a standard for a long time and it's assessing body condition of multi-species, not just horses, but it's used for cats, dogs, so on and so forth. Ah, cool. Okay. Um, so what we want is we want a five, which is neck blends smoothly into body, withers rounded over spinous processes, shoulder blends smoothly into the body, ribs cannot be visually distinguished, but can be easily felt. Back is level, fat around tail head feels soft. Okay. 
I personally like my horses that have foot problems to be a four and a half. I like them to be a little bit on the lean side. It's easier on arthritis. It's easy on laminitic feet. Um, five to me, they, we get a little bit mushy between five, six, and seven. Like a horse can, we can call a horse a five and they're really a six or a seven. And then you start getting into trouble. So let me show you some pictures. Okay. okay. Yeah, that'll be easier to see. So these are a couple of examples of obese horses. I could do this. I could do this all day long. I have so many pictures of obese horses. I should just start like a before and after older and like, yeah, the changes because you can totally change these horses. People say, oh, their crest never goes away. Yes, it does. Yes, it does. Sometimes you have to get them really skinny because that those fat pads are really sick fat and they have a lot of toxins in them and the body holds on to them. It's like, they're like wax, you know, they're like, they're just really bad. Um, that adipose fat. And, um, you know, it's, it's what's in the crest specifically and in the orbital fat pads. So you can get some weight off these horses, but they'll keep their crest sometime, but they'll get rid of the crest if you really get them controlled. So don't give up if you've got weight off of them, but there's still a crest, look deeper as to what's going on. Okay. You know, can you talk about the horse in the middle? Because a lot of people would look at that horse and not see it as a seven. Right. Right. So she is, and wait till I show you what she looked like when she was skinny. Cause I'm going to show you here in a second. Okay. She, she is fat all over. So she has a very even distribution of fat. She does actually have a crest here. She's got a fat pad behind her shoulder, behind her withers here. She's got huge fat pad on her tail head. See the lump right there. Yep. Okay. That's huge. She does have a channel down her back. Um, and then she does have orbital fat pads over her eyes. That's hard to see in this picture. But this is a horse that has an even distribution of obesity. Whereas, right. for example, like this horse, she's fat, but she's also got the pot belly, right? The big crusty neck where it's really obvious. And there was a really cool study that came out um, not that long ago, really. Although since we all lost COVID year, it was probably actually five years ago. But, you know, it feels like it was recent where you can palpate that crest on the neck. And if it's rock hard, you are in danger city. Like your insulin is super high because what causes the problem for these horses is the insulin. We know that because studies have been done where they gave like metabolically sound thoroughbreds and then metabolically sound ponies excess insulin and they all foundered regardless of their body type or breed predisposition. So yeah. excess insulin for this type of, of endocrinopathic laminitis is what really tips the scale. So every, this is all about regulating the insulin. So if you change the diet, you change the management, you get them off the grass, you do whatever you can to give them um, low glycemic, meaning it's not gonna spike their insulin and their glucose, right? Even levels of sugars, because horses eat carbohydrates, right? Not like us, we can't just stop eating carbohydrates. They, they can't, we can, they can't. Um, they will get that crest will be rock hard. And if you get those carbohydrates that are making them have sugar spikes or insulin spikes out of their system, that crest will soften in an hour. Wow. So you can literally use that. If you're working on getting your horse's like metabolic situation under control, one of the first signs you're gonna see that you're, you're on the right track is you're gonna palpate that hard rock hard crest and it's gonna get squishy and then really squishy and then wiggly and then start going down. So that's a good, that's a good indicator. Really good indicator. Didn't yeah, realize so it could change that fast. Yeah, it's not wild. Like this yeah. horse's crest is rock hard. This is a horse, she had a little crest under here, but it was rock hard. And she was horribly foundered, like horrible. And now when you palpate that crest, is, is it, um, is there a specific place along the crest where it's most beneficial to palpate or is it just all the way along? Well, the anatomy of that neck, right? Is that the, the withers, the nuchal ligament comes off the withers and attaches to the head of the horse, right? Right. So there's, there's muscle all, all wrapping around that down to the vertebrae on the neck. So, you know, if this isn't pretty straight and feels like just like mane and skin and some muscle, if you feel any lumpy squishiness, that's a crest. So, so any lumpy squishiness, regardless of breed. Yes. Because you get people go, well, this is a crusty breed. Right. <laughs> and I do understand that certain like stallions can have more crust because of hormones, things like that. But that's why you don't just use one indicator, okay? Right? You're going to use all these multiple locations, and then you're going to combine that with other things. What do the feet look like? 
What is the horse eating? What is the horse's age? Phenotype is not just looking at fat pads. It's also looking at the, like the whole picture of the horse, like age predisposition. You know, these horses, as they age, they get higher risk for these types of metabolic laminitis. Although I've had a two-year-old that actually had, you know, metabolic laminitis, a four-year-old. They weren't Cushing's, but they had insulin problems already. Wow. So as they get older, these things get more prevalent. You can look at their feet, do radiographs, right? Um, the veterinarian is going to do blood work and look at what the blood values look like to see if your horse on paper looks like as much at risk of the phenotype. Okay. Okay. So you're going to look for corroborating things, but you know, if you think to yourself, I just really want to make sure that my horse is okay. Baseline radiographs and a baseline panel of blood work with your veterinarian for a metabolic panel, which I'm going to describe what that looks like is the way to go. But, okay. but, you know, um, sort of the, the down and dirty version is check the crest, look for the pat pads, take an action. Yeah. Right. So that's why I started here. Yeah. Because to me, and, and don't be offended if somebody says your horse is fat, please. Because we see our horses every day. We tend not to see it. I know. I know. And as the farrier or the hoof care provider, we're really, really suited to evaluate your horse's body condition on a visit to visit basis. Even though that's not really our job, the health of your horse's feet is. So if you're working with someone who's savvy about preventative hoof care, not just what I have today, which some people are and some people aren't, then you are going to have the benefit of somebody that's gonna tell you, you know, I'm seeing some changes in the feet and your horse has gained some weight in the last three months. I think that you should talk to your vet about your horse's risk status for laminitis, right? So just because somebody like me brings it up or somebody like Wendy brings it up, it, we're trying to help you prevent a huge problem. Right. And sometimes I've had to look at people, like I'll get called in because a horse has ring bone and they want me to work on the feet. And I look at the horse and I'm like, you know, you're, you're in a situation where you're at risk of a huge crash here. Like this is really concerning to me because to me, obesity is often considered benign neglect. Like we look at an emaciated horse and we're like, oh, that horse, they don't take care of that horse. They're, they're not giving that horse enough to eat. Right. And yet we look at an obese horse, like, like this one here, this poor mare, and this is not considered neglect or abuse. It's, it's just our mentality. Oh, it's the horse has plenty to eat. Yeah, but you're killing it. Right. Killing it with kindness. Right. So, you know, I have this like tough love perspective of like, you know, if I'm responsible for your horse's feet, then we need to talk about preventative things just as much as we talk about what I'm doing today while I'm with your horse. Just my two cents. Okay. okay. So this is this horse. She changed this weight in three months. Now she's got a sway back. We can't change that. You know, that was part of her, of her situation, but she went from this, you know, crusty neck, all these fat pads channel down her back to, you can see her ribs here. She still has a little fat pad back here. Really the crest is mostly gone at this point. And then we got her to here where that crest was like gone. Wow. She has a little hump here if you're being really picky. Right. And she was barefoot and she was sound like no problem. We rehabbed her in boots. Um, they put in a very nice dry lot for her, got her off the grass completely, changed her diet, did blood work. The vet prescribed appropriate medication. And, you know, in three months we got her to here. It was great. Okay. And here's that mare. Wow. Yeah. Right. Well, she's not obese. Yes. And then we sent her home like this. I mean, she was skinny. She was like a three body condition scale but we got rid of all the lumps. And a lot of times I think everybody sees the fat as muscle. So she had no muscle there. So this is actually her lean, her lean condition. And the vet was totally on board with her being this lean going home. Look at her, she looks gorgeous. Well, I was gonna say it, you, you can barely see her ribs in that picture. She's got a waistline, she's shiny. Um, you know, you can see some muscle definition. And again, this is a deceiving horse because, you know, you look at the picture on the left and from a general perspective, like you say, her fat is so well distributed right. that we, we tend not to see that horse's fat. Right. Exactly. Exactly. So, you know, she was, she was generally obese everywhere. And then what was cool about her, and this is one of the conversations we have when we get to the healthcare component is 
why would you shoe a horse versus not shoe a horse? Um, you know, I use glue on composites, but one of the reasons why we put her in shoes was because I wanted her to get moving faster. So this is our property here at the farm and we have these nice dry lots. That's the driveway. This is one dry lot, this is another dry lot. So I wanted her moving as quickly as possible and she could move better in glue on shoes than she was able to do in boots. So very quickly, she came around, responded well to the diet changes and the medical changes that our vet made. And then we got her in shoes because she was finally totally stable. And she was, she was in, a, in a herd with two other horses and they moved all the time. You know, somebody just brought up a really good point that people might be afraid of having a horse too lean because we're so um, sensitive to abused thin horses. Right. Right. Absolutely. We're so allergic to that idea and the and what that means that we've kind of overcompensated. Um, Absolutely. I totally agree with that because, you know, um, one of the veterinarians I work with here is a, a fabulous vet, Dr. Jim Holt, who is the um, veterinarian who supervises the New Holland sales auction. And if you knew, know New Holland, there's a ton of horses that run through there that go to some very not nice places. And yet he's there to do a service, which is make sure that horses that are not fit to go don't go. And that the horses that go are healthy enough to travel and the ones that he can pull out and he works with all the rescues, he can place in rescue. So he works very proactively on the benefit of the horse, but he sees so many emaciated horses. Right. That when he and I work on laminitis cases together with these metabolic horses and I'm like, oh, this horse is like way too fat. He's like, it could lose a little weight, yeah. right? Where when I'm like, oh, look, I can see the ribs a little bit. I love that. And he's like, okay. Because <laughs> we have like the opposite bias, right? right? So I understand that. Like, I really understand that. And, and I think it's important to remember and be kind. You know, we're not trying to beat anybody up with these things, but try to light a fire under somebody because if you don't have a problem yet, we're not inclined to change things. No, this is very, very true. We get into that into that pattern of routine where if it's, not you know yelling at us in the face we just kind of go along is it called entropy i'm pretty sure that's the word <laughs> right exactly so here's this mare look how cool this is whoa this was eight eight weeks. We, wait a second how'd you do this in eight weeks I, look sh shamelessly i have to plug the beamer on this because this mare was managed super well at home she got from here to here like in the first maybe three months, but she wasn't comfortable and she wasn't dropping weight fast enough. She had a nice big stall. She had a nice dry lot turnout the owners put in. She changed the diet to whatever I said. The vet was on board. We had good medication on board to treat her obesity and her metabolic problems. So she actually came to our farm specifically to get Beamer. And it just boosted everything we were doing. Like it blew me away. I couldn't believe that we got this much change in eight weeks. Wow. It was yeah, wild. I mean, like, I can't lose that much weight in eight weeks. <laughs> no, and you, and most people would tell you that it was unhealthy, right? Like the guideline is 10 pounds a week. So for her to go from this level of obesity to here is like, I think she honestly had a lot of like retained fluid. Like, I think she was like a bloated tick. I, yeah, I would have to agree with you because there's, there's just from, you know, uh, the standpoint of understanding losing weight that there ha there had to have been a lot of fluid there that she was exactly just right and I wouldn't have guessed that and unfortunately we were just weren't able to get her like her system jump started enough um because the owner had all the right things in place so somebody's so, asking what beamer is and yeah. while um we can send them to you to find out a lot more because you have a lot on your website right yes well no it's not on my website but they can contact me on Facebook and I can send them some info um, it's PEMF, so it increases circulation. So Which is the pulse electromagnetic field therapy. Yeah, right? pulse electromagnetic field. Yeah, it's good stuff. Increases microcirculation, which of course is a lot of what we deal with with laminitis. Yep. Okay, so why does this all happen then? Why do these horses get obese? Why why is this such a problem? You know, why is the grass a problem now when it wasn't in the past? We talk a lot about you know genetically modified um, grass breeds that were developed by the the USDA for cows, right? They wanted better milk producers. They wanted um, uh, fatter steers, right, to go to slaughter. More resistant uh, grass breeds to drought. 
Um, and they basically increase the carbohydrates in our grass. And none of us really understood that. So we all thought, oh, it resists drought. Let's, let's reseed with that. That's great. And then now we all have this high sugar grasses in our pastures. So that's part of it. Part of it is um, that our horses work less than they used to, right? Like it used to be, you know, your horse took you into town for the day and brought you home or, you know, um, they were more working animals. And our horses now are a lot of times um, companions. So they don't work as hard, but yet our feeding practices remain the same for a long time. Our horses are living longer, right? Like mm -hmm. our horses are staying sound into their geriatric years. We never had to used to have to deal with geriatric horses, but now we do. And that changes their metabolisms. I, I don't know if you remember, but when I was a kid, 19 was an ancient horse. Yep. And now 39, my horse is 30. Now my horse is 35. You know, it's yep. like, so it have, really changed that number that are over 30. Yes. Absolutely. It's like, what? Um, we have more pesticides, right? That are in our environment that might affect our animals greatly. We really don't understand the impact of that. Um, fortified feeds came along, right? We have our feed companies throwing all these minerals and supplements and this and that in our feeds. And we really don't understand the exact benefit of those things or the long-term implication of those things sometimes. You know, the nutritional requirements for horses is, is really not very specific. It's really adapted from other animals, um, especially here in the U.S. because our horses are not food animals. So right. they get to do all sorts of things that they don't do in the food production industry. They do in our horse feeds that they don't do other places, which is really interesting. And well, the GMO that's come into the feed that we don't know about. Right, right, absolutely. GMO corn, GMO beef, soy. soy, exactly. Yeah, there's a ton of stuff. Um, and then what about new illnesses? Like, I don't know if we've always had the same level of, you know, tick-borne disease like we have now. Did we have that 20 years ago, 30 years no. ago? I don't think so. No. So, you know, this is why this happens. Um, you know, our horses are different. Our environments are different. And it's unfortunately just like us, right? Like we didn't have the high incidence of, you um, of type two diabetes and obesity until the advent of high fructose corn syrup. Right. Like it made everything rampant. What was that in the eighties? Like everything just exploded. So these yeah. things matter. Okay? And you know, in, in New Zealand, it's really interesting because when I used to go there in the nineties, <laughs> the horses were lovely. And I don't ever remember them talking about this thing that happens to them now, which is in the spring. There's I've forgotten what they call it. It's kind of like grass fever. The horses go kind of nutty. Ooh. And, but the difference is now when I go there, they've cleared the land to, to raise dairy cattle. And so the grass for dairy cattle is quite different. And I, I mean, I, I was so shocked when I was there in, in 19, 2019, because they were talking about this. And I was like, you know, I just had no memory after going to New Zealand for six years in the nineties. So, you know, things are, have changed. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So intervention, right? Understanding these problems and intervention. That's what we're talking about. So if your horse is an ideal body condition, then you're at less risk of laminitis, period. So if you can keep your horse at that four and a half to five body condition scale on the Heineke scale, you're gonna be at less risk of laminitis. Now things can still happen, but you're reducing risk, okay? Um, you know, ECIR, the Equine Cushing's an insulin resistant site, um, they've for years um, promoted this idea of DDT and E and it's a great model. Diet diagnosis, trim and exercise is the model that they follow to help rehabilitate um, metabolic horses. Um, you know, I've used this as a loose model for what I've done for a long time. You know, Dr. Kellen has taught me a lot. And um, yet at the same time, I modified it just a little bit um, only because instead of trim, yes, the trim is important, but your whole hoof care protocol is important, right? So more than just the trim. Um, it needs to be your, the entire hoof care management. Um, I misspelled exercise. That's terrible. I was typing too fast. Well, um, your pesticides is missing a T, but I wasn't going to say Oh, it. man. <laughs> you can okay. do spell check on each slide. Brilliant people misspell things all the time. Oh, good. Oh, good. I'm right in there. Because right. right. our brains are going really fast and we're typing out these words and we don't care about the spelling because you know what I mean anyway? Yeah. So, <laughs> size is appropriate, of course. But I, I have to include the team in there because when I see that horses don't do well that I'm working on, it's because somebody on the team is doing something different and mucking up the system, right? Give me an example. 
So like, okay, so let's say that you have, um, you have a vet who you come into a horse and you, um, you look at the horse and you're like, oh my gosh, I'm worried that your horse has laminitis. Um, let's call the vet and get the vet out here um, so that they can look at your horse and give you an idea. And they come out and you're like, this horse has laminitis. And I can't say that the horse has laminitis because I can't diagnose that, but I'm going to just make sure that the person implements some investigation with the diagnostician, the veterinarian. So um, the vet comes out and says, oh, it's just an abscess. Soak the horse, no problem. Movement is good. Keep them on turnout, no problem. And you're like, what? What do you mean? This is laminitis. This horse is a 911. This horse can't, don't soak the foot. We don't want to make the foot wet right now. Don't turn the horse out. And the horse needs blood work. The horse needs metabolic blood work. And the vet's just like, nah, give it four or five days and let me know when it pops out. Like, how can you be successful with that scenario? You can't. And, you know, it, it, it could be the, it could be the trimmer that says, oh, this horse is fine. It could be the oh, barn manager that says this. So it doesn't, you know, the, my point being, it's not necessarily just your vet that is, um, has a different perspective. Right. Well, you asked me for an example. I know I did. I'm just <laughs> sharing the love. I'm not picking on the vets. Don't worry. I love my vets. I, that's the most critical person that I rely on in helping these horses is my veterinarians. Right. Um, so no, but it can be something like, honestly, sometimes the owner is the problem, right? Where the owner is like, oh, I only gave him a little bit of apple today or, oh, he's not know. fat. I like him this way. I like him this way. I don't need a dry lot. I'm not going to, no, I'll just make it a mud lot. It's fine. There's no grass. It's fine. The mud's fine. Right. And, and that's fine. I totally respect people have different ways of solving problems. But if you're, if I'm trying to be a team with you and Sergio and rehab your horse, if we're not on the same page, we're going to get frustrated and it's not going to be productive because if the horse doesn't do well, I'm going to point a finger at that mud lot, or I'm going to look at the person and say, I told you so. Right. Or my answer is to not say anything and then hope that it's going to go well and have anxiety and fear and, and, um, you know, like worry about the animal. Well, and let's talk about the dollars and cents because so often somebody says, you know, I really can't afford to have the vet out to take some radiographs right now. Can you afford the cost of a laminated horse? Right. So that's exactly it because lam rehabbing laminated horses is expensive. It's very expensive and it's a long process. You know, it goes on for, you know, a year at least in the rehab process. So you're gonna need multiple sets of radiographs. You're gonna need multiple sets of blood work, multiple vet visits. Farrier's gonna be there a lot helping you. You're gonna need therapeutic shoeing or fancy hoof boots or some hoof care expense you might not have had otherwise. So yeah, absolutely. You know, it is much less expensive to prevent the laminitis from ever happening. Absolutely. So there's a couple of questions. Yes. One is how do you feed forage in your rehab program? Forage meaning our hay? I would think so. Okay. So in our program, um, we, well, I think that's the next slide. Okay. <laughs> uh, okay. So I just, uh, and maybe you have an answer to this. The other question is, do you have resources for creating an appropriate dry lot? Yeah, I have a page on my website. Um, if you search Daisy Haven Farm dry lot, it'll come up in Google. Um, and it has uh, pretty detailed examples of dry lots and how to build them. I make it very uh, non-complicated. Like there's a lot of ways you can make them very expensive and you can also do it very inexpensively. Um, if you need help, just message me or email me and I'm glad to give you some input as well. Okay, and it's Daisy Haven Farm, right? Yep, you got it. So um, the, there's a lot of different ideas about diet. Um, we, we do basic hay testing to make sure that it's uh, you know low ESC plus starch. If you feel the fructans are important, so you wanna use NSC, that's up to you. There's a lot of debate as to whether fructans are really an issue or not. Um, okay. I, you started talking a lot of acronyms here. Oh, well, this is like, this is like, you know, the highbrow stuff, right? This is where you got to go do your research on these websites to decide what makes sense to you. Um, ESC plus starch versus NSC is the way we measure sugar content in feed and forage. Um, and the guideline is usually less than 10% of one or the other. Um, we could talk for hours about the whole fructan debate. But um, suffice it to say, there's a debate about that, about whether fructans are important. 
Um, I do not use NSC and I don't worry about fructans and I have yet to see a problem from that. But there are people that will equally say that it's a huge issue. And I don't know if that's regional. I don't know. I don't know what the difference is, but I try to keep things simple. And there's a lot more hay that's safe if you do not consider fructans. So, so let me kind of back up a little bit. And clearly what you have to do here is have your hay tested. Well, you don't, yes, you should, you, ideally. But remember, you're talking about what can someone afford? What can they manage? What's not so stressful? The, the bottom line of this impractical reality comes down to this. If you look at NSC, meaning non-structural carbohydrates, which is a combination of the ESC, WSC, and starch. Okay, the WSC is the fructans. If you look at that number of NSC and your goal is less than 10%, then really only 50 to 60% of haze are safe. So it would eliminate a lot of haze from consideration. Okay. On the other hand, if you look at ESC plus starch, then 90% of hay is safe if you don't consider the fructans, if you're still trying to stay below 10%. Okay. So what that meant to me was the things about hay that I tend to look at, because I don't, I, I got to keep these things simple. This is complicated no, enough. No, I know. That's why I'm trying to. <laughs> I know. So the things that I look at on a hay analysis are my ESC plus starch, my digestible energy. Okay. You want that between 80 and 90%. If it's above 90%, that means your hay is very high calorie. So they're going to eat a little bit and get a lot of calories. If it's below 80%, that means it's a lot of fiber and it's not very palatable to the horse and they might not eat it. Okay. So you want something between 0 0.9, 0 0.80, 0 0.90 DE, digestible energy. I want to make sure that my iron is under hundred parts per million because iron is inflammatory. Depending if you have a high iron area, our, our area here is incredibly high iron. It's in our water, it's in our hay. And I think that's most places. Um, and other than that, I don't really worry about it. So, so, so if someone wanted to test their hay, I mean, I had my hay tested and I actually feed rabbit mail. So I got the drill insert yep. probe to, to do the hay sample, but um, the, where I've forgotten where I, I was Cornell, wasn't it? I sent it to Equi Analytical. Yep. Which is, yep. which is in Ithaca. Um, and they do a really comprehensive panel. Usually it's the 603 trainer package that you want yep. um, to do everything, but then you need someone to interpret it for you. Exactly. You've got to have a nutritionist that you can reach out to, or you can use one of the online resources like ECIR. You can join their group and post your hay analysis and you'll get some feedback about that. And they have whole articles and tutorials about how to interpret these things. Dr. Callen has a great nutritional analysis course that you can take if you want to learn the specifics from her perspective. It's not everybody's perspective, but it's her, it's what she's figured out for these horses. And I think it's generally a great place to start. Um, so, you know, so, my, so to bottom line this, you need to test your hay to know what is in it so that you know what your starch level and your ES, C, ES, 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 is. Yeah, ethanol soluble carbohydrates and starch. I don't test my hay. You don't. So how do you, do you just guess? No, 90% of hay is safe. So, ah, I see what you're saying. So look, so if I'm going to spend my time and energy starting with something, I'm going to work on appropriate calorie restriction. Like if you're not trying to stress yourself out like Matt, I, this yeah. is probably- This really side stressed me out because I've already done hay analysis, but this is not- And I used to do it. And then I used to get all the minerals and custom balance them to my hay. And I just said enough. Ah. I, this can't be practical. Horses cannot be this complicated on a day-to-day -day basis. They can't, I can't, this is not realistic. Okay, I did it for years and it drove me insane. This is lovely. I'm so glad you're saying this because like I said, this slide started to make me crazy. <laughs> I know, I know. So listen, so here's the thing. If I go into an emergency situation and I give my diet recommendations because a lot of times the owner's desperate, they don't know what to do. And at least I have the practical experience where I've been doing this for 17 years with these horses every day with different envir environments, different haze, different vets, whatever. And I manage 12 of them, give or take a few on the farm every day. Like I live this, eat this, sleep this, breathe this. I would not recommend something to someone that I didn't find worked hardcore on my own program. Okay. Okay. So take it from what I'm saying. I don't test the hay. If I do everything else and then I'm still having problems, I might test the hay because maybe you were one of those unlucky people that got one batch of high sugar hay or high digestible energy hay. Okay. However, 
when I go to clients and their horse is actively laminitic, I don't tell them to soak the hay. I don't tell them to test the hay. I ask them to weigh the hay. Okay. okay. Because one of the hardest things about this is you don't want to calorie restrict these horses too much because if they go without eating um, more than an hour, they'll get a spike in their insulin. Okay. So keeping the insulin level low and even is the most important part is to my understanding. So what we do is we say, okay, if you're obese, you can either give one and a half percent of the current body weight. So say you're 200 pounds overweight, do one and a half percent of the total body weight. That's your amount of hay you're allowed to have in a 24 hour period. The goal is to feed that amount of hay. So it takes them 24 hours to eat it. Okay. I got it. I got stuck in all the starch things. I know. Don't just... Thank you. No, Don't this is that, okay. <laughs> so if, if you, or you can look at 2% of what you feel the ideal weight would be, whichever is greater. Cause we want to feed these horses. My horses end up self-regulating. We feed free choice. hay. Wow. So okay. I don't stress about the hay. Like I used to really stress about the hay, but then I changed some things. Okay. And this is where what I do deviates from Dr. Callen's protocol just a little bit. And you know, but, you guys. But have that's, okay, but that's interesting. And and you know, like one of the things I did was I got they're called hay pillows, mm -hmm. and they're yeah. canvas on one side with net on the other, and they yeah. are great for slow feeding because the horses can, you can throw them out in the pasture and you can bash them around the barn and. Yeah, and we use we nibble nets. Yeah. You no, know, because I can hang them and I can move them around different places in the paddocks and they can move from bag to bag to bag. And I get them with one inch holes, which are really tiny right. on one side and one and a quarter inch holes on the other side, which are just a little bit bigger. And if the horses don't need to lose weight, like they're not in a crisis situation, I'm not trying to regulate their food intake, then we just open the top of the hay bag and they can eat out of it like it's a hay bag. So, so what you said about the insulin spiking, if they don't have food every hour, you're going to get an insulin spike. Yeah, that's what I understand. So, but, but, you know, you think about how so many horses are fed in barns. They're given hay in the morning and hay at night, and they spend six to eight to 12 hours with no food in front of them. Right. right. And we wonder why they colic and why they, you know, get health issues and they stress and they develop bad habits and they um, don't process their food properly. So, you know, they end up with um, obesity issues because they're just, they're in starvation mode half the time. Somebody's asking if you have a recommendation for a good water filter to li limit iron in the water. I don't. The reason I don't is because um, we have a house system and our, our farm is fed off of the house water. So we have like a actual like filtration system on our well tank. So yeah, I don't. you're on a well in Pennsylvania with tons of minerals, it would just. Right. It would get clogged up in a heartbeat. An RV filter wouldn't do it for us. Um, you can use one of those RV filters. I know there's a lot of information on them out there. Um, I know the, some of the Facebook groups, some of the nutritional Facebook groups and the ECIR group all have recommendations on that. Um, but honestly, if your horses are getting excess minerals and iron and nitrates and things like that, you are too. So maybe you just want to put a whole system on your house. I, you know, that was my take on it. Um, so, you know, like to me, my, my current diet is really, really easy. And if anybody wants a copy of that, I can send to you what I actually feed. Um, you know, there's this whole question about, you know, eliminating iron, um, also about the, the question about mineral sources, like are sulfates and polysaccharides a problem for our horses or not? I personally saw huge improvements in my horses when I switched to chelates and amino acid complexes. So where your minerals come from for certain animals might matter. Okay. I mean, we don't have enough research. We don't know enough information. Chelates and amino acid complexes aren't going to hurt a horse. Um, but I did see a lot of improvement by eliminating like copper sulfate, right? Instead of copper sulfate, it'd be copper amino acid complex. Um, it matters, right? Um, and then providing your omega fatty acids. I mean, you know, just some flax is usually the easiest. Um, they're all good. Rice bran can be a little bit inflammatory, but so don't use a lot of that, but the flax, the hemp, the vitamin E, they're all great. What about chia? Chia's fine. Yeah. I just, that's what we feed. So I just noticed that it's not there. Yeah. Well, you know, um, um, 
cannabis is also supposed to be good hemp, right? Oh yeah, hemp's also- there. And we do use, we actually feed both hemp and hemp oil and chia seeds. Yeah, we, you know, honestly, we use flax because it's really good. It's easy to stabilize and it's inexpensive to feed to the entire barn. So yeah. that's what we use. Um, but, you know, I think that, I think that anywhere you start on this idea is going to help you. So, you know, there's a lot of education out there about these things. Um, anybody who wants to see what I'm doing, I'm happy to send you my, you know, what I figured out for the farm. It's inexpensive, it's simple, and it's easily adjustable for different caloric needs of different horses. Like we have, should we do a webinar on that? We can, yeah, sure. But why don't we? Because, because you know, I mean, bottom line with your experience and having 12 horses at a time on your farm, you've, you've figured out things that work. If they're simple and easy, yeah. you know, we can just talk about that. And I think sure. it's a lot easier than either trying to send people or trying to sit, talk about it tonight. <laughs> no, I agree. Because there's more to cover, right? Yeah. Okay. So if you decide that you need to have your veterinarian get involved to help you assess whether your horse is at risk for laminitis, um, you're going to want to look at the phenotype in detail. You know, what's your horse's history, body condition? You want to do radiographs of your horse's feet. I mean, baseline radiographs are so preventative and you can never go back and see what you had. If they get laminitis, you don't know if the changes in their feet are new or they've been there for five years. So personally, I would talk to your veterinarian about, you know, if you do vaccines or you do spring evaluations or health checks or whatever you do routinely, then also ask for them to create a package for you of inexpensive baseline radiographs. Okay. It's, it, they should be able to do it for you. It shouldn't be ridiculous. It depends on your vet. And if your vet can't do it, find someone who will do it. Somebody well, with digital x-ray now, it's so much simpler. I mean, the equipment that they have to do that kind of thing is is a whole lot easier. And there's more and more emphasis on annual radiographs. Um, yeah. Dr. Kelleher talked about it. Some other people in webinars have talked about it. Um, so I think that's starting to move into what we think of as routine annuals. Yes, exactly, exactly. Um, if you suspect that there's some metabolic disease going on, your vet might do this type of blood work, okay? You might take an insulin, um, a leptin is a little more sensitive. So if the insulin comes back fairly normal, but the leptin is elevated, this is what controls the horse's ability to regulate their hunger drive. And people. So, yeah, right. And people. So leptin is a good one to look at. Um, some of these horses, they just eat and eat and eat and eat. And, eat, and if they don't, don't eat, they're angry. They get really pissy about food. Um, that usually to me is a red flag that their leptin might be out of whack. Um, you might take a glucose as well because comparing the glucose to insulin ratio is sometimes helpful. It's, it's taken from people. So it's not always exactly relatable, but, um, it can be, it can be helpful in certain situations. Um, a thyroid panel. I mean, all of these things for endocrinopathic, endocrinopathic laminitis are in, are correlated, right? They all are in a loop together. They all interact. So you can look at this from, from an insulin perspective. You can look at it from a thyroid perspective, although that's secondary to the insulin problem. Um, When you look at ACTH, that's a function of the pituitary gland functioning properly, which is again, a secondary problem, which is why it's Cushing's syndrome, not Cushing's disease. Cushing's disease would be an actual tumor on the pituitary gland. These horses don't usually have that. This is usually secondary, (coughs) excuse me, but um, it's often a way that we can also start to regulate these things for the horse because they all affect the same system. Um, if the ACTH comes back to normal, but you're still concerned, or your vet might suggest a TRH stimulation test, this is more sensitive and is safe for the horse. Um, you can look at a Kansas State University iron panel if you're worried about your iron overload issue. Um, there's a couple of protocols around. Um, Anne Marie Hancock has one um, on how to do this. Um, it, it, there is some information in the ECIR site as well. About, about how to do this test and what to look at for iron overload issues, which would just keep your horse in potentially an inflamed state. Um, and then there is now this oral sugar test, which um, I'm, I hate to say it, but I did actually give to my horse, Wendy, and he foundered from it, so. From um, the test? Yeah. Yeah, we were, we were, it was brand new. I, I was trying to be objective about assessing his risk status. He had gained some weight on a low diet that had always served him well. He was 27. So I was like, all right, buddy, like how aggressive do I need to be? And his blood work came back totally normal. ACTH and insulin were totally normal, high end of normal, but normal. 
And so I was like, his body is telling me that something's going on. So um, I had just spoken at um, uh, Davis. Um, I did a, a presentation for them um, and spoke with Dr. Nick Frank, who's at Tufts, who's a laminitis expert. And we were talking about this test and um, it has really, really direct application for understanding the horse's response to sugar. Because what you do is you give them a 60 cc syringe of caro syrup, and then you take an insulin after a period of time and a second insulin at a period of time to see what their insulin response is to the sugar. If the insulin response is appropriate, then you're fine. If the insulin response is inappropriate, then you're in trouble because they're overproducing insulin, which is gonna affect their feet. Well, we had done this test, it'd been two weeks, it came back normal. I talked to my vet about doing this oral sugar test. I'm like, I really want hard numbers. I need to quantify this because otherwise it's just my anxiety. He's my own horse and I can't be objective about it. And so we decided to do this. So we did the oral sugar test and I was smart. I did an insulin level before we gave him the oral sugar test because I wanted to really understand where his insulin was before we gave him the caro syrup. And I literally said to my vet, I said, are you sure this is okay? He has the caro syrup drawn up and he's about to put it in my horse's mouth who has not had a blade of grass or any excess sugar for 15 years. And we went and gave him 60 cc's of corn syrup. Of course he foundered because yeah. he was at risk because when the blood work came back, he literally foundered hard. I kid you not two days later, it was absolutely from the caro syrup. It just tipped him over the edge. I knew he was in trouble. I was trying to be non-emotional and very objective about what I was thinking with my horse because we get, get in our own way. And when we got the blood work back, the initial blood work before we gave him the caro syrup was over 200. It was off the typical measurable. Scale. So he was, he, if you had just done the insulin test, you would have known not to do the sugar test. Exactly. So we caught a low moment in time. So all I'm saying is if you have a horse that you're like, I'm worried this horse is gonna get laminitis, this is probably not the horse to do, the test to do. Right. It's it's a good test. It does what it's supposed to do, but I wouldn't want to give an, a, an insulin spike to a horse who's at risk of getting laminitis at any moment or has laminitis. <coughs> Excuse so, me. So, you know, the thing that, that for me, the thing that really sticks out to me on this entire talk is the insulin is related to the lam the metabolic laminitis. Absolutely. Yep. And I had never, um, I had never put that together. I mean, I, you know, ACTH, blah, 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 but I had never put together insulin as, as a cause, a right. spike in insulin. It's the absolute cause. And now look, you know, there's other complicating things. If right. you have Lyme disease and it's creating inflammation in the body and then the horse doesn't feel good and then they get antibiotics and it tanks their gut flora and they happen to be a little borderline metabolic and then the spring grass comes in and they crush. Like, so, so could we kind of think of them as type two diabetics? Absolutely, yeah, it's very similar. It's very similar. The, the, the dilemma is that like anything, like how much time do we spend now thinking about ourselves about our inflammatory state for ourselves? Right. right. Like if you eat too much sugar, you have gluten, you um, drink a lot of alcohol, you um, have an underlying autoimmune condition. Um, you know, what's the health of your microbiome in your gut, the horse's microbiome. We're learning so much more about how to have a healthy functioning system. And that way we can resist or our body can overcome the things that assault us on a regular basis without undue reaction. And so to me, what this is a function of is the horse is assaulted with all these different things that have come due to changes in management, changes in genetics, changes in, you know, whatever those, those lists we talked about, and they get to a point of inflammation, whatever that is, it can come from a variety of different ways. So my goal with what I do to help the horse, even as a hoof care provider, but as someone who works specifically on rehab is to eliminate as many sources of inflammation for that animal as possible. You know, but the thing that's so striking to me is how what's going on in the horses is mirroring what's been happening with people over the past 40 years. Yes. Yeah. It's, it's absolutely the same, the same dynamic, which is wild. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's 
omnivore versus herbivore. We're talking about, you know, equine versus, you know, human. Yeah. I mean, the, there should be a lot of differences, but it's the, it's the same thing. And I think it has the same, you know, um, sources. And Joyce has always called uh, laminitis a heart attack in the hoof. Right. Yeah, right. Because it's about the circulation. Yeah. Right. And so it's the same thing, you know, it's heart attacks in people with the whole inflammation and, and everything. And um, let me ask you this question before you talk about that slide. Um, yeah. Somebody says, I have a draft cross and he has hay all day to eat, but he would be as big as a Goodyear blimp if he had hay all day to eat. I use a nibble net slow feeder, but he still goes through two flakes in a couple of hours. I, I know someone like this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but you can't starve those horses. Well, what it's about is, is having an appropriate amount of hay over 24 hours, eating it as slowly as possible. I mean, a draft horse needs to have a fair number of calories. So, you know, it sounds to me like it would be better to slow him down more, even if you had to put that hay in a bag. So like I get the 12 inch nibble nets they're called double nibbles. So they have mesh on both sides and you can put like a huge amount of hay in one bag at a time. And then if they needed to slow down even more, we would put a net around the hay and put that in the nibble net. So like a regular hay net and put that in. So then they have to get through the little crevices even more. You make them work harder. Yeah. To slow them down, but they're still eating. Now, when, when the horse's leptin wasn't controlled, then they get so angry at those hay bags and having to work so hard to get the hay out, they would bang them. Like they would like bash them and kick them and bite them and they get really angry. So if, if you really feel like you're trying to slow him down, he's not slowing down, I would look further because he should be able to self-regulate to some degree, right? right? Well, and you know, Al's a draft cross. And when he came as a child, he did not lift his hay out of the <laughs> round bell, but you know, we have a net, we have a net over the round bell. We have to feed round bells because he is a hay burner, which is a draft horse. That's what they are. Um, but he self-regulates. I mean, I see him many times now just standing quietly. So, so if you have a horse that can't seem to get enough like that, then we need to look at those leptin levels and figure out if there's, if there's <laughs> something. I've heard, I've heard Dr. Getty speak many times about that horses should have free choice hay. And if you give them free choice hay, they will eventually self-regulate because they stop being so worried about not having hay. Um, you know, I think with our metabolic horses, I think we have to take that with a grain of salt because if they're just getting too many calories, you can still run into the same obesity issues. So knowing your horse's weight, doing a weight tape, you know, once a week, once a month, using the same weight tape, using the same technique in the same place, you're looking for a change of weight over time, not how much exactly does this horse weigh. So a little bit of variability is okay because what we've learned is weight tapes are actually fairly accurate. And you know, you can you can certainly look at, oh, my, my horse has gained 20 pounds. I better be careful with what's going on with his calorie intake. Or, oh, you know, my horse is losing the 10 pounds a week. We're on the right track. We can keep doing what we're doing. So you know, the weight tape is your best friend when you're trying to be objective about these things and keeping a chart and keeping notes. You know, we keep notes on the weight on every horse here. We weigh them, you know, every Monday. Yeah, I think we really need a webinar on on what your management system is there. Because sure. every time, yeah, we keep getting other little tidbits like we weight tape every, every. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Okay. Well, I don't know, are we out of time? I feel like we've- There is no time. time in this webinar, keep going. But, okay, <laughs> good, okay. <laughs> So now, now comes my part, right? Which is like, what do we do about hoof care? Because there's all these different things we're going to do when it comes to laminitis. Every single one of these things here is something someone puts on a foot for laminitis, which is bananas. That there's so much variability, right? Like somebody once said to me, oh, you could nail a banana on a laminated court foot and they'd do well. Okay, I'd like to see that. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Um, so, you know, my go-to for my acute horses, and that's if they're acute or chronic subacute, is going to be a boot, either a soft ride or a cloud. I tend to gravitate towards the clouds because they're lighter, um, but the soft rides are nice as well. If that's what you have, that's great. One of the things I really appreciate about these boots is that they are on a wedge. The, the pads in them are on a wedge. Now, why would that be important? 
because we have the whole like when you when you work on a laminated course are you going to raise the heels or lower the heels we have this whole debate there's a whole school of people that believe we need to relieve tension on the deep digital flexor tendon on the back of the leg raise those heels because the tendon is pulling the bone out of position right and then there's a whole nother school of people that are like that's baloney we need to lower the heels absolutely lower the heels get the heels down get realignment no matter what so my response to people with these things is there's no way that there's this brilliant group of people that believes you need to raise the heels that they're all wrong. And then there's no way that there's this amazing other brilliant group of people that believe that we needed to do realignment trims and get the heels down. Like there has to be something that's, that's a difference between them. So to me, what it's about is that when you have an acute horse and it's this chronic subacute kind of thing, yes, you want to, to do a, a realignment trim. And we can talk more about that or not, you know, that's like a whole nother thing. But what that means is correcting the rotation or the displacement of the bone. But when, when people talk about the tendon pulling the bone out of position, what they're talking about is if you have this foundered laminated hoof capsule, this bone should be in alignment. And I have a picture of that to show you. It should be in alignment here, you know, more tightly with the capsule. And you've got a big dish and deviation here. And this bottom of the bone angle should be <clears throat> ideally between five and eight degrees. And this horse's is 15 degrees. So this is a problem, chronic, subacute laminated foot. And so that tendon, you can actually see it in this radiograph here, it goes all the way down over the navicular bone and attaches to the bottom of P3. So it is not the tendon pulling the bone out of, out of position. I think this has been poorly communicated over time because what's actually happening is in locomotion, how does the horse break over? Wendy Murdoch. Is that, are you asking that as a question? You mean yeah. how, how, how physically it's yeah. the last thing to leave the ground as the horse raises the heel? Is that what you mean? Yeah. So like the phase of the stride is right. break over yes. is when the heel lifts off and then the toe leaves the ground. That's right. like okay. a phase of breakover, right? Yep. What, what causes the leg to do that? Wow. The nervous system. <laughs> Okay, how about what brings the foot along? You've got this nervous system with all these oh. ligaments and muscles and tendons and bones, and the foot has to get off the ground and travel forward and land squarely on the ground. What is responsible for that breakover phase of the stride? Well, it's going to be the length of the toe in terms yeah. of wet. No, nope. I hate these test questions. <laughs> no, let me tell you. Well, it's, I mean, in locomotion, you're going to have a contraction of muscle. It's going to change the joint angles. It's going to lift the leg. So it travels through the air and then it's going to land. Yes. And so one the mechanical that, length of the toe is going to determine when that breakover occurs in the stride. I'm not talking about when I'm talking about what brings the foot. Oh, well, it's going to be the contraction of the, uh, flexors. Correct. The deep digital flexor muscle, which pulls on the tendon. Correct. Oh, I see where you're going. Okay. Yeah. So here's the problem. The tendon pulls on the bottom of the bone and then the foot comes along and then the extensors pull on the front of the bone and help the foot land flat in the landing phase. Correct. Okay. Yep. Okay. Yes. So, sorry, I was being really linear and you have so much knowledge about this. You made it really complicated, but it's lovely because I was right with you. Um, but linearly, what pulls the heel up off the ground and initiates breakover is the deep digital flexor tendon and muscle. Well, actually it's the muscle attached to the deep digital. Correct. And the tendon comes along, right? Right. I know we have these lay person ways of describing things and it confuses things. Yeah. However, the point of this is that in that breakover phase in locomotion, the, what brings the hoof capsule with the bone is the lamini, the attachment of the sensitive and the insensitive lamini. So if you put leverage on the bottom of this bone, so you take this badly modeled foundered coffin bone, down here is where that tendon attaches. Right. And if you take that and you pull on it and the lamini that attach the capsule are not well connected, it's going to pull it further apart. It, it's simple physics actually, when you have it a higher, tension on the back without a, a, a matching tension of the lamina on the front, it's, it's going to sink. It, it's going to detach. There's going to be leverage on something that's not solid is the way that I think about it. You have a more elo eloquent way of saying that, but so, so we say, oh, you know, the, the tendon pulls the bone out of position. No, 
but the action of normal locomotion has a consequence in this effect. Because the lamina is not strong enough to hold the wall to the coffin bone, basically. Right. So the bone moves, but the foot doesn't come with it. Right. So it's yeah. like walking inside loose shoes. Yes, like your foot sloshes around all over the place because you're not securely connected. The shoe doesn't come with you as quickly as your leg is moving. Correct, yeah. like my slippers. Okay. Right, so the moral of this is that those boots that we were talking about, being on a wedge in a chronic subacute laminitic state gives you insurance. It allows you to lower the heel because we have no crystal ball to know how much of the lamina is affected. Right. We don't know. There's no way to see that on, on a radiograph, right? And nope. you can't ultrasound it. So you can't see. MRI, with an MRI, you could see. Yeah, some but that's a really expensive proposition. Right? That's not very common. No, so, no. <clears throat> so to me, I yes, I want to realign things. And most of our chronic horses can be realigned fairly well. However, because we don't have a crystal ball and scary enough, even after you get the insulin controlled, even after you get the insulin controlled, they can still rotate or sink for up to six weeks. Yeah, it's horrible. And that comes from, from Dr. Pollitt on our, you know, I did that lovely one-on-one -on -one whiteboard um, study session with him. He let me, he said, ask me any question you want. I'm like, okay, where do I start? So he told me, he said, it's six weeks. They've studied it. Wow. So even if you start, the clock starts today and you change the diet, you get them off the grass, you, they start losing weight, you can still see foot changes six up to six weeks later. You're not out of the woods. So the, the wedge on these pads gives you insurance about the amount of damage you have and the idea that locomotion is potentially problematic. So having the horse quiet, some level of stall rest in the really acute phase is maybe not a bad idea. If and you, you have, don't have to worry about the fact that the boot increases the toe length and therefore changes the breakover? Well, I, I take my grinder and I grind the breakover back on the boot. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Fine. Yeah. Just thought I'd ask. <laughs> yeah, like, like it's a pros and cons thing. Exactly. But, well, that's that's why I brought it up. Yeah. And, and honestly, what I think is I like the cloud pad a little bit more than the soft ride pad because the cloud pad conforms. So let's say that horse is feeling uncomfortable about the muscle engaging and the pull of the tendon on the bottom of the bone, like it's putting leverage on things. They can actually go more to their toe. They can choose where to put their balance. So you can still trim the foot for realignment, but that insurance of adding that little bit of wedge back in to me is really nice when I'm trying to help a horse that's struggling. Um, we have a question. Okay. Would you use cloud boots with a chronic sta uh, stable horse with low heels? Yeah, sure. That'd be great. Yeah, absolutely. If they can live in boots. I mean, to me, if a horse has to live in boots for its whole life, that might be a time and place for a composite shoe that's a little bit more semi-permanent as opposed to a boot that's a lot of management. But I have plenty of geriatric horses with lots of other issues that the owner is willing to babysit the boots and they live in boots. It's fine. <coughs> Sorry. Okay. okay. <clears throat> so the other thing that you can do preventatively. Oh, okay. So uh, wait, let me ask you this question. Okay. okay. So I'm why is it that you think then that there's such that people are so strongly in one camp or the other? Because the, we, have, you know, because we have religious, religious level convictions about the things about horses. Yeah. Okay. About anything. You know, no, it's true. I mean, because I mean, what what we've just talked about makes so much sense to me. Just understanding forces and physics, right? Um, All these people can't be completely wrong, right? Like people that say, "Oh, you cannot glue to the sole. You'll make a horse dead lame." Well, yeah, sure you can, but I do it every day. So I figured out a way to do it that I don't make them sore. So anytime you say "always," "never," yeah right or wrong, you're eliminating your brain from processing possibilities. And that's why I do all the documentation that I do because I want, like, I have such an A-type personality and I'm so almost- no kidding. <laughs> yeah, so OCD about these things. My apprentice Kimmy today made a comment that made me laugh. I'm a mess with everything. I garden, I get dirt everywhere. I eat, it's all over me. Like my brain is 16 places and you know, everything's chaos unless 
I'm trimming and shoeing a horse. So somehow in that moment, I can zero in and I get very focused and it's like all my controlling thought processes focus right there. And that's what the documentation has given me because I'm able to look at things completely objectively and measurably over time. So over 17 years of this, I have a really, really good idea about, hey, I did that and this happened. And then I did that and this happened. And then I did that and that, I didn't like the outcome of that. Cause we learn the most sometimes when we make mistakes, right? Absolutely, yeah, yeah. Right? So, <laughs> so guess how I learned that you can't always lower the heels on these horses because sometimes I'd lower heels and it would backfire on me. Right. right. And I studied with all the different mindsets. I was open and I studied with everyone because I like, how is somebody raising heels 22 degrees and helping horses with laminitis? Like, I want to know what they're doing and why they think that that's beneficial. And I saw the benefit of that, but I also learned the time and place for it. I, and I think, I think you've just hit the nail on the head there that you need to explore all the options and then you pick the options that's right for the thing in front of you. Right. And you can't, uh, you know, when you start making generalizations about how something should be done, you're not taking into consideration the, the specific one that's in front of you in that moment. And that's the one you have to deal with. Exactly. Because that these things are, you know, complex systems. They're not simple systems. We don't have a car where, you know, your timing belt breaks, you replace your timing belt, everything runs again. It's not right. like, right? Law of un unintended consequences. Input Absolutely. A doesn't always come out C, right? So, you know, you learn that when you are meticulous in your study. Yeah. So, you know, I just, I've learned there's, there's never a never, right? There's never an always. There's always a time and place. I used to say, oh my gosh, why would you do a hoof wall resection? That's barbaric. Why would you cut the horse's tendon in laminitis? That's awful. The tendon doesn't pull anything. Well, guess what? 25 horses I've worked on have had tenotomies with brilliant success. So there's a time and place for it, but you have to be selective and know when and be educated. Yep. Okay. Okay. Cool. I love it. Okay. So, you know, in my teaching program, I've narrowed down hoof types that you can see externally what's on the outside of the foot and you can narrow that down into what's going on on the inside because not everyone has access to radiograph. So when you look at what I call a high palmar angle chronic laminitis foot, which is like what we've been talking about with spring problems, you can see things externally that absolutely tell you what's going on in the inside, that this horse has had laminitis and that it's been a slow slide and you should be able to look at that or the or your farrier or your healthcare provider should look at that and be able to help you say, we got to catch this here, okay? So um, when you look at these feet, they're going to have a hoof passion axis that's broken forward. Now, this horse actually doesn't, which is interesting, but we ideally on a normal foot, healthy foot, we want the hoof passion axis to be generally very straight, which means these joints line up to center of joints like so, okay? In chronic laminitis, usually this axis is broken forward in this direction. And what that's about is the, the phalangeal rotation. So your, your bones in the distal limb or the, the lower limb of the foot would be considered your phalange, right? So phalangeal rotation is when the axis of the coffin bone rotates away from the pastern. And then capsular rotation, the hoof capsule, is when you have the capsule that is not a, no longer aligned with the bone because this growth should be parallel to the bone and this bottom angle should be no more than eight degrees. So when you see those things going on internally, you when you see that internally, there are correlating things externally, like the white line will be stretched, okay? So on this foot here, you can see that the white line, which I have pictures of and should be normally one eighth inch thick is very wide here, okay? The farrier who trimmed this horse, trimmed him three days before, and said, I can't pull the toe back any further because he'll bleed. Because we're taught, don't go into the white line. And he didn't recognize the stretched white line. And this foot matches this radiograph. Look how much toe is there. Yep. And toe leverage on these horses is a bad idea. So, you know, I was called in by the vet because the vet said, we need to, we need to take more on this foot. That's okay, good job. Thanks for trying, we're gonna do more, okay? You might have um, flat 
sole at the toe. This horse is very flat with a good bruise here. You might see presence of hoof rings, right? Hoof rings can be nutritional changes, systemic changes, stress, can be a diet change in a positive direction, but concentric hoof rings, especially if they're wider at the heel than the toe, meaning you have more circulation at the heel than the toe, would be an, an indicator of chronic laminitis. So if you have hoof rings, don't be complacent about that. Start asking some questions. Your horse should not have hoof rings, okay? Um, you might have deep collateral grooves because- Can I just ask one question on that? When, when you go from winter to spring, is it not unusual to have a hoof ring just because of the change in this, the seasonal change and the change, sure. obviously changing grass, but- A single hoof ring. Okay. Okay. Yeah, you have a diet change, you're gonna get a ring and a change of growth above it coming in. Okay. Sure. But if you have like multiple hoof rings, that's a sign of inflammation. Okay. Period. I just Period. wanted to clarify that a little. Thank you. Good one. Okay. Um, you might have deep, deep collateral grooves around the frog because you've got a lot of room here, height in the frog. You're probably gonna have a dish to the dorsal wall. Your coronary band angle, now this one's a little funky because he's got quite the um, uh, rise here in the middle but it's going to be shallow. There's a direct relationship between the, the angle of the bone and the relationship, if I can do it this way, this way, coronary band, okay? So if the palmar angle is high, the coronary band is shallow. If the heels are too low, the coronary band is steeper. Okay. Okay, so you can, you can relate that. Um, and then of course the pain level of the horse might be telling, but if you don't have pain, you can still have laminitis like we talked about. So you'd wanna look for some of these things, okay? Just to give you an idea of what the hoof capsule on a healthy foot might look like versus a foundered foot, okay? This palmar angle is six degrees. This one is 14 degrees, that bottom angle of the bone. There's a dish to the dorsal wall. This, see how this coronary band angle is more shallow compared to this one being steeper? Just slow down a little bit, okay? Sorry. <laughs> That's Cover okay. The <laughs> so the, the one on the right is uh, steeper. Lemonade. Yep. This bottom angle is steeper. Okay. So, so the coronary goal, band, just do the coronary band again. This one right here, yellow right here. Yeah, okay. Now it's like more parallel to the ground and this one has a little more of an acute angle on it. Okay. Okay. Um, the dish to the dorsal wall. This one, the growth is parallel to the front of the coffin bone, which would be normal. Okay. Just some things to look at. This was a chronic subacute laminitic foot. This was a healthy sound horse that was jumping Grand Prix. Now your little purple dotted line. Yeah, this one or this one? The darker purple, but both of them actually. Okay. okay. So this one is a representation of the corium. Our radiographs are so good now. You can actually see where the blood and nerve supply is around the bone on a lot of these radiographs. Okay, and sometimes in laminitis, the, cor the corium elongates or gets really thick and wide. So if you're a hoof care provider or you are a hoof care provider, look for where that corium is. Cause sometimes if let's say you have like a lot of ski tipping going on, it can come all the way out here. You might not be able to get as much correction in this foot. And that would be important to know for, before you trim. And then this dark purple line here is the um, Palmar curve. The Palmar curve is a measure of relative concavity of the bone. Um, this would be the side of the bone. I know I have a healthy bone here somewhere. There we go, I think it's this one. <clears throat> okay, so I know it's little, put it right up here. Doo -doo -doo. So palmar angle, and then the palmar curve is where the concavity, this is half a bone, so it looks a little funny, but it's where the relative concavity, this where the deep digital flexor tendon attaches here. Okay. Okay. So when you have laminitis, you often get a flattening of the palmar curve because you lose like the, the bone models in a flatter way usually to be very simple about it. So, you know, some horses are naturally built flat footed. And what you'll see is this palmar curve is very shallow and long and comes back more like this. And then there's no depth between the palmar curve and this line, which is the wings of the bone. That'd be the sides of the bone. Uh, the palmar curve is bright white on a radiograph because the tendon comes down and attaches there. So that bone is very dense. So it has to be strong and denser things in radiographs are whiter because the x-rays don't pass through them as easily where things that are um, less dense, liquid or gas, 
become darker because they're more exposed to the, to the x-rays passing through them. That's how radiographs are exposed. With me so far? Yep. Okay. So if you're looking at the architecture of that sole, so you're looking at the bottom of your horse's foot and you're like, hmm, is my horse's foot healthy? Should I be worried about laminitis? You should have several colors. Now this of course is a dark foot. If you have a light foot, this is gonna be more yellow, like tan, but that's your outer wall. That's your pigmented wall. Then you have your inner wall, which is higher moisture content. Then your white line, which ideally would only be an eighth of an inch wide. It is not white. I was going to say that it's like, it's not white. Why are we calling it a white line? Because back in our history, because farriery has a long history since Roman times, right? What we think happened is they looked at the inner wall, this high moisture content wall, and they called it the white line, right? But in reality, there's another structure here, which somewhere along the line started becoming called the white line. And so when you look at old texts of, oh, you want this one? Okay, sorry, dinner time. Um, when you look at old texts of drawings of the anatomy of the horse's foot, it shows the white line going all the way to the coronary band, which it doesn't. The white line grows from a blending, Never mind. it's too complicated. The white line grows from the bottom of the coffin bone. Let's just say that the rim of the bottom of the coffin bone. You listen to Bob's lecture if you want to hear more about that. Um, but, um, but when you look at the inner wall, it does go all the way to the to the coronary band. So there's there's been a switch of names here. So some people call this the golden line. You know, you hear water line thrown around. Suffice it to say, your white line should be an eighth of an inch wide, waxy in, in appearance and tight like this. Okay. And, and here's really not white and it's not white it's really yellow and it what's job is to seal the soul to the wall that's the job of the white line period it prevents the infiltration of bacteria and debris okay so when you have laminitis and you have chronic laminitis with rotation or sinking that white line then stretches and that's what this is like this is like a mild white line and you know at some point you know i could pull up some slides for us that are pretty interesting where you can zoom in on these things and you can see the lamini that are stretched. It's wild. So what happens is that pulling, it elongates everything. The sensitive lamini get longer and certain parts of them break off and tear and rip and you get hemorrhage and it's bad. And then the, the insensitive ones elongate and so you get this widening and it becomes like a scar. Is that what you call, what did you used to call it? The laminar uh, wedge? Mm -hmm. A laminar wedge is a bunch of disorganized hoof material that is trying to hold this all together. And on really bad cases, like this horse here that, you know, lost two thirds or three quarters of his coffin bone, right? I mean, look at that. There's like, it's like, it's like gone. Um, on this foundered foot, um, you know, like you're gonna have a, a huge scar and the scar, like, you know, scar tissue can be stronger than normal structure. So, a functional stable scar is why these horses can become chronic stable. They also can get a tight white line back if they're not too bad. So I have a lot of horses I work on that regain a tight white line. It's still just not as good as it was before, but it can get that one eighth inch wide and waxy. And that's awesome to see because then you know you really have things well controlled. Right. Okay. Um, you know, you might look at as the hoof care provider, these are the things that I look at on a radiograph to determine mm -hmm where my misalignments are, you know, you, you want to get rid of this rotation, dorsal wall deviation, and the broken forward hoof pasture axis, it's relating the joint, where's the joint going. So if this axis breaks this way, the joint is going forward. On a low heeled horse, it's going to be broken back. And that's relating which direction is the joint going. So it'd be going back and this would be more broken that way. Um, and then what's your heel height? And then what's your dorsal wall deviation? Uh, to me, just as a side note, dorsal wall deviation, you know, the vet will come to you and say, oh, your horse has 17 degrees rotation. That rotation is not a prognostic indicator to me. Like when I hear rotation, I'm like, okay, that's, that's not really that relevant to me because I can take my rasp or my grinder and I can trim that and make it parallel in one trim and get rid of the entire rotation. 
So how is that? I didn't fix the foot. I didn't heal anything. I just reduced the distortion and took leverage off the toe. Some people like to do that. Some people don't, but it's not changing the prognosis of the horse. So when you hear rotation, don't get scared. Okay. Like, yeah, you have rotation. The amount of rotation you have is something that your team has to deal with, but it is not going to tell you how bad your horse is. It's not just my opinion. Okay. Okay. When you have subclinical laminitis, these are the things you're going to see. Okay. Retracted soles. We all hate the word retracted. What does retracted soul mean? This is something that's come along, honestly, in the last five or eight years. We didn't have these before. And what we started- didn't have retracted soles or we didn't talk about it? We didn't have them. We didn't have them. Because some, you know, I've been doing this for 17 years and you would right. go, you would trim a foot and you would just trim it. And like, it was no big deal. And then all of a sudden you'd go and you'd trim a horse and you'd be like, wow, look at this sole callus. This is amazing. The sole ridge I have, I love this. And you'd give them a trim like this, which, you know, depending on your trim style or whatever, some of you might think that that toe's too far back. That's irrelevant. The point is, is you would trim the foot like you always did. And then all of a sudden the horse is crippled and you're like, what the heck? I have a good sole ridge. Why would I now have a crippled horse? I don't understand. I have protection. Right. And what it is, is it's this abrupt curving of the sole. So you get a flattening of the sole in front of the frog apex and this abrupt turn of the sole. And the best thing that we think about is distal descent. So like if you have a horse, say that um, has subclinical laminitis where the lamini are inflamed, they can swell, they can elongate a little bit without a catastrophic crash. So what you're going to see with these retracted soles, where you have this flattening of the sole here and this like weird callousy thing with this abrupt nine degree turn at the toe, they're usually meaning 90% of the time are going to have associated white line disease. Okay. Well, white line disease is an infection in the white line area. Sometimes it's in a bit of the inner wall, like this part right here. Um, sometimes it's actually the white line gets really separated and gets a lot of bacteria in it. Well, we just said that the job of a healthy white line is to seal the sole to the wall and prevent the infiltration of bacteria and debris. So a number of veterinarians I work with started talking about the fact that when they see this, they think it's subclinical laminitis because the white line should be able to resist infection, just like the frog, right? Like if you can't fight off infection, you're not healthy. So this to them was a sign of, of subclinical laminitis. And if you have a retracted sole, what I see when I see retracted soles, when I get radiographs of those horses, even if they've had no incidents of laminitis in the past, they've like, in terms of like, there's no acute crash. When you say, did your horse have laminitis before? The owner says, no. Do you know the previous owner have? No, no, no history of laminitis. There are bony changes and foot changes internally that are indicative of laminitis. So when I see a retracted sole, even if the horse is sound, it's a big 911 to me. I'm like, all right, we got to figure out what's going on with your horse because something in your foot's changed and these will come and go. We used to think it was moisture related, you know, like wet season, they would get retracted soles and a little bit of white line disease and a little bit of thrush. Like it was just moisture. But I've seen horses in dry season in Arizona get the same thing. So moisture change seems to be connected for us here in our, you know, four climate zone where we have four true seasons, I think for us, what happens is we see this when it gets wet out in the spring, but also the spring grass is coming in and the horse's feet are changing a little bit and the, their, their hormones are changing and the ticks are coming out and all these things are happening and they just get inflamed for whatever reason they get inflamed and it coincides with mud season but I don't think it's really the moisture because it's not linear enough. And it's also about there, if you have a barn, like I, there's lots of barns I work in where I work on 10 or 12 horses and you'll have two that get this. So if they're all eating the same thing, living in the same environment, managed the same way over time, if it was truly only environmental, why would they not all get it and then all get rid of it? Mm -hmm. There has to be something underlying about those specific individuals. Um, and so again, when you look at the radiographs, they've all got bone changes. So if you see a retracted sole on your horse, if you have white line disease, 
my advice to you is to start asking questions and you might get pushback from your vet or pushback from your farrier because they might be like, what are you talking about? This is white Lyme disease. This isn't laminitis. Just ask questions. Can we do some radiographs? What should I do to be proactive about this? You know, we like to put hoof armor on these horses feet because it's toughening and drying and it's a antimicrobial barrier, you know, it makes them a little tougher. These horses like boots, they like glue on shoes. And unfortunately this retracted sole has to grow out. So while you're waiting for it to grow out and you're taking care of your horse's feet, start investigating what's going on. Some people are having to leave because we're going on for so long. I know. It's okay. All the webinars are on the Surefoot Equine YouTube channel and this one will be posted there too, probably not till tomorrow. Um... I just have a teeny bit more. I'm almost done actually. Okay, somebody asked a question if thrush is an indication of inflammation or laminitis. I wouldn't necessarily say that. I mean, ideally, if you had a healthy horse that had a good immune system, they would fight off thrush because lots of horses that live in muddy environments don't get thrush, like consistently don't get thrush. So yeah, I would, I would be looking at the overall health and wellness of my horse, especially if I have a chronic thrush problem, not just a one-time incident. Um, certainly... That doesn't count the frog shedding seasonally because frogs will pop off and you'll get pockets under there and you get a little bit of thrush because there's an environment for that. But more like you have like a huge thrush explosion, like clearly the back of this horse's foot is not that healthy. This one was better, but this one had a lot of thrush issues, really pinched heels. He had very boxy feet. Um, and he was actually a horse, horse with a lot of health problems we couldn't figure out. We knew he was sick. He would, he was having, um, falling down episodes. We thought were seizures. Um, he wasn't metabolic. He might've had cancer. He finally fell down and had a seizure and, um, hurt himself badly enough that they had to put him down. So we never figured out what was wrong with him, but this was really broken. This was a horse that was, um, this was before we figured out about retracted soles because now I would never touch that sole ridge because they just get sore. Um, but he was high in the toe. So I was trying to like level out his foot a little bit because they get this like ridge and you're like, oh, I just want to rasp that and take it down. And it's like, don't do that. Um, it's my advice. But um, this horse had a lot of bone changes on their radiograph. So thrush, you know, if it's a one-time incident, I think that's probably just reasonable. But if it's chronic or you're having a lot of trouble getting rid of it, um, I'd start looking at your horse's immune system and what's going on. You know, it's, it's, go well, it just seems like the, uh, by the way, my cat alarm got, went off, but <laughs> um, the health of the foot is a direct relationship to the health of the horse. I mean, no foot, no horse. It, we come right back to that again. Right. Absolutely. In fact, that, that brings up my next thing to look for, which is I think my last point, um, that this is a dissection of this horse's foot. And what I want you all to keep in mind is that our, our bars, our heel and our bars here, um, if you know what you're looking at, so this is the bone with the sole corium. This would have been the white line, but it was nipped off in this type of dissection. And then the sole was peeled back. So you could see the inside of the insensitive sole, the inside of the insensitive lamini of the bar, and then your sensitive bar lamini and your coronary band and your sensitive frog. So it's basically open like a clamshell. And what's cool to see in this kind of view is that your, your bars have lamini as well and have white line, wall, and sole. So the bar is a wall structure, which means when you have a low heel horse, they get stretched white line of the bar that to many veterinarians is reverse laminitis, is laminitis of the bar. So when we talk a lot about different trimming techniques, do I trim the bars, do I not trim the bars? Um, I like to trim my bars so they follow the concavity of the sole because to me it's wall and if it's too tall or if it's bent or broken or has an infection track, it's distortion. And I would like to build a non-distorted foot the best I can control. This horse had a big bruise and a big nasty abscess and look here how this bar lamini, these are corns. This area is called the seat of corn. And this corn is this hardened, hyperkeratinized horn from these heels chronically curling in over time and being low healed and having too much compression on the corium over time, which has created inflammation, which has caused stretching of the bar lamini. This white line should be one, one eighth inch wide um, and waxy and tight going through here. 
like this one is tighter, but it's still, you know, some people call these bar smears, but reality, they're just stretched line of the line of the bar. So it's telling you that you've got a back of the foot problem and notice that these horses also have thrush back here, right? So inf inflammation. Um, so keep in mind that, that, that laminitis or itis of the foot inflammation manifests itself in many different ways. And we're just really starting to catalog and understand when our feet are actually in trouble. So that retracted sole is a red flag. The white line disease is a red flag. If you have a horse that's considered thin sold, it's a red flag. Don't just be satisfied with, oh, my horse is thin sold. Figure out if there's something you can proactively do about it. If you have a horse that has low heels or heel pain or heel problems, think of it sometimes like laminitis. It's still an inflammatory problem. You know, ring bone, side bone, arthritis, navicular problems, they're all itises, they're all inflammatory. So the horses I work with are inflamed horses that have either front of the foot problems or back of the foot problems. Sometimes they have both and that sucks. Okay, so I just wanted to try, if you guys are thinking about, you know, the purpose of this discussion is what should I look for with laminitis? What, what's in trouble when you get to the foot, it's not just as simple as, you know, oh, I've got a dish to my wall, my horse has rotation, I better do something about it. These signs can be really subtle that you're run, gonna run into trouble. The body condition can tell you, the um, other details about the horse, you know, maybe breed predisposition, because yes, we do think like thoroughbreds are a little less likely to get um, obesity related laminitis than say an Arabian, but thoroughbreds do. So don't say, you know, never, because I've worked on them. Um, and then if you have any of these other things going on, really think about the inflammatory state of your animal like you think about yourself. I mean, that's, that's where I've gotten to with it at least. Okay, that was it. See, we made it. Woohoo! I know, it, it was a lot and I tried to keep it very relevant. I hope you appreciate how I really tried to stay on topic. Yeah, yes. and. Um... And, and my battery's held up, so I'm really happy. Um, <laughs> so, so we've clarified that we at least need a discussion of what you do for management at Daisy Haven Farm. Yep. Okay. Yep. That um, insulin and laminitis are closely related, similar to type two diabetes in people, and you got to regulate that insulin. Um, why spring is relative? That's so that, spring. Spring. Right, and that there's a lot of signs that we can see in the foot long before we're ever in the in the red danger danger zone that give us clues: the contracted sole, white line, stretched lamina, mm -hmm. um, shape of the uh, coronary band. If I got it right? Yeah, yeah, and this information is all available on my Facebook page and in a lot of the hoof care groups. I post things. And, um, you know, we could even do something on distortions of the foot. Like, how do you read the distortions of the outside to see what's going on in the inside? Because I love talking about that stuff. Because okay. you can train your eye. It's really... No, it's really important. So, all right. So that means that I'll have Alex get in touch with you to book you for April and May. <laughs> Great. I love it. Um, I love it. And you can tell her the topics because you'll remember. And I'm being alarmed at because it's dinner time for the cat and I'm all by myself. Yes. Sounds like you've got some alarms going on by <laughs> yes dinner time for the dogs yes thank you Wendy this is really fun thank it's you been fantastic it's uh, you know it's such great information and it's and it's stuff that we can actually go out and look at our horses and employ so thank you so much Daisy once again for sharing all of your wealth of knowledge really really appreciate it thanks Wendy it's been fun talk soon yep. see you guys. bye everybody see you bye. later have a great night